So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information. Created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERPI widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERPI has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SERPI has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes, labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication, and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies, o PIDS, na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiyang makakatulong sa ating bansa. 
sinusulo ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ng kalagahan ng polisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakahalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag polisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, EIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERP widget or type serp pidsgovph SERP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SERPI has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes, labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Social Economic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. 
Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan mo na gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiyang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ang kalagahan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag pulisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! Welcome to the PIDS webinar series. Before we start the webinar, we would like to give you a few reminders. For attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry. In case you have a question, the moderator will read it during the open forum. For those attending via Cisco WebEx, use the chat box located at the lower part of the screen. Click the chat icon, type your name and affiliation, and your question, and send to all panelists. You may send your questions while the presentation is in progress. The moderator will read them during the open forum. For Facebook viewers, at least two questions from the comment section will be read by the moderator during the open forum. We will moderate all questions to ensure that they are relevant to the scope of the presentation. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to your active participation. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. This is the PIDS webinar series where we feature PIDS policy studies and the insights of scholars, government policymakers and program implementers, and industry experts and practitioners. With this webinar series, which we started in 2020, we hope to provide an accessible venue for evidence-based discussion of current and emerging development issues. I'm Sheila Siar, and I will be your moderator. In today's webinar, which is our first for 2022, we will have a deeper look into the situation of our young people who are neither in employment nor in education or training, or what is called as the need group. We will also discuss the current landscape of our TVET, or technical vocational education and training programs in the country, and what can be done to make them more responsive to the needs of the learners, especially our youth need. So to officially open our virtual event and give us more information about today's topic, I now give the floor to our Vice President at PIDS, Dr. Marife Ballesteros. Thank you, Sheila. Um, this is the first PIDS public webinar for this year, and I'm privileged to open and uh, welcome you all to this event. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the presence of key officials who joined us today. From the government, we have uh, the Department of Education Undersecretary, 
Diosdado San Antonio, Department of Labor and Employment Undersecretary, Benjo Santos Benavides, Assistant Secretary Dominique Tutay, and Institute for Labor Studies Executive Director Ama uh, Satumba. From the Department of Interior and Local Government, Assistant Secretary Esther Aldana. From the Government Service Insurance System, Senior Vice President Raquel de Guzman, Buen Salida. From the House of Representatives, Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department, Director Dominador Gamboa, and Socioeconomic Research Bureau Executive Director Manuel Aquino. From the National Economic and Development Authority, uh, Director Gurley Grace Iktiben, that from the Department of Science and Technology, Food and Nutrition Research Institute, Director and Scientist Imelda Adefa, from the Department of Education, Bureau of Learning Delivery, Director Le Leila Ariola, from the National Commission on Indigenous Peoples, Director Heroncio Aquillo, Aguillo, and from the Commission of Higher Education, OIC Director Mary Silvette Bunigundo. From the Technical Education and Skills Development Authority, Provincial Directors Vivian Abueva and Winifredo Salas. From the National Youth Commission, Executive Director Leia Villalon. From the National Academy of Science and Technology, Academician Dr. Padolina, William Padolina. From PIDS, we also have uh, our Board of Trustees member, Dr. Gilberto Llanto. From the private sector, we have uh, President Ramon Garcia of In One, One Go Technologies and Program Director Perfecto Bernard of the DMCI Te Technical Training Center. From the, from the academe, let me acknowledge the following. President uh, Angelita Resurrection of Obi Mon Christian Community School, Vice President for Academic Affairs Imelda Dagay of Benguet State University, Campus Director Rufo Bueza of Pol Polytechnic University of the Philippines, Campus Associate Director Eva Montero of the Northern Iloilo um, Polytechnic State University, Batag Campus, uh, Ateneo de Manila University School of Government, Dean Ronald Mendoza. From the CSOs, NGOs, INGOs, we have Metrobank Foundation uh, President Chito Sobrepeña, Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry Executive Director Marlon Mina, Masagana Sakaham Director Daniel Agustin, Young Focus for Education and Development Foundation Assistant Director Bell Animals. Let me also greet our friends from media and uh, our guests, colleagues from the government, academe, civil society, private sector, as well as those who are watching through the PIDS and SERPI Facebook uh, pages. Today's webinar will examine the issues faced by our youth who are not in employment, education, or training. In short, the need. The presence of a need group reflects a social problem that if left unaddressed has serious implications to the country's capacity to achieve progress and sustain growth. In January 2020, the Philippine Statistical Authority recorded about 20 million young people or those aged 14, uh, 15 to 24 years old in the Philippines. And of this number, 16.9% or about uh, 3.9 million are belong to the NEET group. According to the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the NEET are the young that are not accumulating human capital either through education or in the labor force. Therefore, they are at risk of facing disadvantages and exclusion throughout their adult adulthood. Being a part of need can also have adverse mental and social consequences. The concept of need is not a new one. It originated in the United Kingdom in the 1980s and was used mainly in developed countries. 
In 2015, gained prominence in developing economies because reducing the proportion of youth need, need became one of the targets of the social development goal on decent work and economic growth. In the Philippines, the need concept was not widely used as a measure of, of the disadvantaged youth. I think what we are more familiar with are the traditional indicators such as out-of-school youth and youth unemployment rate. While these traditional indicators are useful, they have limitations for a particular age group. For example, out-of-school youth measures are less relevant to those ages 20 to 24 years old as they are already expected to join the labor market. Similarly, the youth unemployment rate is less relevant for those in the 15 to 19 age bracket since they are expected to still be in school uh, 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 during those, those years. By using NEET, the NEET rates, a more holistic picture of youth underutilization is given. So in this webinar, we feature two studies conducted by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. The first study titled, Who are the Youth Need in the Philippines Today? examines the profile of the Filipino youth in the NEET group. This study is authored by no less than our president, PIDS president, Dr. Aniceto Orbeta Jr., PIDS supervising research specialist, John Paul Corpus, and former PIDS research analyst, Nina Arauz. The study was commissioned by the uh, Technical Education and Skills Development Authority, or TESDA, in partnership with the Philippine Business for Education, or the PIBED. The second study, also by the same principal authors, investigated the existing technical and vocational education and training programs, or more commonly known, your TVET programs for the youth. The TVET is seen as an important mechanism to empower the need. The study addresses assess the program's responsiveness to the needs of learners and industries and the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic. This study was also undertaken as part of PIBED's YouthWorks PH initiative. We have also invited as discussants representatives from our partner offices and organizations who will share their insights of the country's need sector and how to improve the country's TVET programs. I wish to thank uh, TESDA Planning Office Executive Director Rosalina Constantino and PIBED Executive Director uh, Lovelaine Basiliote for accepting our invitation. We are also grateful to have with us a TVET provider, Primary Structures Educational Foundation, which is based in Cebu. And we will hear from its president and chief operating office officer, Ms. Paulette Liu, who is part of our panel. Again, I would like to thank uh, everyone for your attendance in today's webinar. And I look forward to your participation in the discussion in the open forum. Good afternoon. I now give you back the floor to our moderator. Sheila. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ballesteros. So friends, at this point, I now invite all of you to pay attention to our featured uh, presentation for this webinar, which as um, uh, Dr. Ballesteros said, is based um, on uh, two PIDS studies, both led by the president of uh, PIDS, Dr. Aniceto Orbeta Jr. And uh, co-authored with Mr. John Paul Corpus and uh, with, with assistance from former uh, research analyst Nina Araos. The presentation will be delivered by Dr. Abeta and Mr. Corpus. Before Dr. Abeta's appointment as president of PIDS in uh, August uh, 2021, he was a senior research fellow at PIDS for 29 years, wherein he led the education and labor policy research team that's that study the uh, key policy recommendations and reforms, including the Pantawid Familia Filipino Program, Sustainable Livelihood Program, the Free, the free uh, Tuition Law, the Enhanced Basic Education Act, or the K-12 Act, 
and the mother tongue based multilingual education program among others. Dr. Arbeta is considered one of the country's pioneers in impact evaluation research. He also specializes in applied economic modeling, social sector issues, demographic economics, and information technologies. He has a PhD in economics from the UP School of Economics and did postdoctoral studies at Harvard University. Meanwhile, uh, Mr. John Paul Corpus, a supervising research uh, specialist at the IDS, has a Bachelor of Arts degree in history and a Master of Arts degree in economics from UP Diliman. He joined the IDS in 2016 to work on impact evaluation and is currently part of the Institute's macroeconomics team. Dr. Abeta and uh, JP, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, am I, uh, does that sound okay? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, JP and I are glad to present in this research workshop two studies on the youth who are not in employment, education, and training, as well as the training landscape in the, in the country. Uh, JP and I will be sharing the presentation. I will present to you the reasons behind the, and the design of the study. JP will present the results, and I will come back for the conclusions and recommendations. Uh, next slide, please. The uh, study was uh, actually, uh, as mentioned by uh, Vice President uh, Ballesteros, conducted together with TESDA and the Philippine Business for Education or PBED uh, for their project uh, called Youth Work Philippines. Uh, we'd like to thank them for uh, asking PIDS to do this study with them. Uh, this is a very useful one. And next, uh, next slide, please. The significance of the study has been uh, outlined by uh, Vice President Ballesteros as well, uh, is that uh, emanates from the belief that uh, being not in employment, or youth not being not uh, in employment, education, and training can undermine their uh, uh, future uh, employment and uh, earning prospects. Uh, leading to lasting economic disadvantage. In addition, being in EET or NEET can also have adverse social consequences such as depression, weaker uh, social engagement, and possibly de deviant behavior. Thus, having needs comes as a great cost to economy and society. Thus, it's a very important topic that has to be uh, understood well. Uh, we, as mentioned also earlier that there is about 3.9 million Filipino youth in January 2021, or about 16% of the youth population uh, who are in EET. So it's uh, natural to look at the question whether this is a demand or a supply issue. Uh, it would be useful to look at the profiles of the in EET, youth in EET and the reasons why they are not in employment, education, or in training. Or it is uh, a question about the training landscape. Training programs can help the youth find uh, employment, but these programs need to be responsive to the labor market demand. Next slide, please. The research question for the first study titled, Who are the youth needs in the Philippines? Uh, addresses five research questions. One is, the, who are the youth needs in the Philippines? What are the dropout points of learners across the education continuum? Uh, who are the need, uh, uh, how are the need computed uh, and monitored across government agencies? And how many need are potential Tibet learners? And lastly, what barriers do need face in pursuing their uh, further training? Uh, we are presenting this at the same time so that it will not be uh, uh, the two studies. So it will be uh, to listen the back and forth between me and JP. So I'll just present again the study, second study, which is uh, uh, basically looking at the supply side, uh, which has this research questions. What are the existing training programs uh, for your Philippines uh, priority sectors? 
and uh, how responsive are the current training programs to the industry needs? And is there industry demand for uh, new uh, national certificates or INSEES? How did the COVID-19 pandemic impact training programs and what industry sectors emerged due to the COVID-19 pandemic? Okay, so let me now uh, turn to the conceptual framework. The conceptual framework uh, and the is, is, is the same for the two studies. The two studies uh, uh, deals, but dealing with different blocks of this uh, 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 conceptual framework. The conceptual framework is described in three major groups. This is the economic and training environment. Uh, the intermediate outcomes, of course, and the final outcomes that you, you want to have the need to be in, in school or in training or be or employed. And uh, that uh, training and, uh, and, and employment could give them a uh, wage and income uh, that uh, will support them through uh, their productive lives. So uh, the figure provides uh, the comprehensive uh, uh environment surrounding the youth needs uh, the activities of the youth are dependent on the underlying economic and training environment this is the uh, leftmost uh, group of, of components this consists of the general economic and industrial structure uh, determining the demand for for skills and the supply side of the training consisting of the training institutions and their course offering on the one hand and the households deciding to educate or train uh, to be trained in the other. Government and non-government institutions tries to influence these decisions by providing programs, their own programs as well. These interactions are supposed to produce the intermediate outcomes, is the middle block, uh, consisting of demands for skills and new skills supply. Uh, and these are supposed to generate the final outcome which we, the society is interested in, uh, of youth being in training uh, or employed, and, and finally get their uh, wages and income. The first study is focused on uh, the household decisions over uh, education and training. This is component, a component of box B uh, and the government programs is in box C. The second study on the other hand, uh, focuses on the training institution which is also in box B, the, the training component of box B and as well as the program catering to the youth in box C as well as the course offering enrollment and participation in box E. Okay, so that's, that's how the, the two studies are, are situated in uh, trying to uh, explain these blocks in, in this general conceptual framework that we have for the study. Next slide, please. Uh, this, this slides, uh, the next two slides uh, will, will show you how we tried, uh, how we use data to answer the questions. To answer the research questions, who are the youth needs and what are the dropout points and how many needs are, are potential Tibet learners, we use the analysis, uh, we analyze the uh, uh, Philippine Statistical Authority survey data, particularly the labor force survey, the family income and uh, expenditure survey, and the annual poverty indicator survey to answer that question. Uh, to answer the question of how do government agencies measure and monitor the need, we, we uh, reviewed PSA documents and did interviews with relevant government offices, as, as uh, mentioned in this uh, slide. And finally, to answer the question on barriers that uh, keep the youth need from pursuing TVET, we did an online survey of TESDA and Youth Work uh, Philippines uh, trainees. That, that's how we uh, ask, uh, use data to answer the research questions. Next slide, please. For the second study, uh, we use test the secondary data and test the documents to answer the question of what are the existing training programs for youth work Philippine priority sectors. Uh, and we use the interviews and roundtable discussions with enterprise-based training providers to answer the next set of questions that is, uh, how responsive are the current training programs to industry needs, uh, particularly secondary data for, uh, is there a uh, uh, youth need, uh, a need for new national certificates, and also the in interviews on how did the COVID-19 pandemic impact the training programs 
and what industry sectors emerged due to the training uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Tested documents were also used to answer the question on national certificates and interviews also provide the insights of the responsiveness of the current training programs. Now, let me turn to JP for the results. JP, you're on mute. Can you speak again? Hello? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. All right. Okay. So uh, we will first uh, discuss the findings of the first study, which is who are the youth need in the Philippines. First, we will discuss uh, the first part. The first part of the study is uh, an analysis of the profile of the Filipino need. So uh, in uh, January 2021, there were an estimated 3.9 uh, million Filipino need, and this consists of 19.4% of, of the youth population. This is based on uh, the labor force survey. Although uh, from the October 2021 edition of the labor force survey, this proportion has already gone down to 3.9%. So in this slide, we uh, discuss the prevalence of need among among uh, different subgroups subgroups of the Filipino youth. And here we use uh, data from the uh, 2019 rounds of the labor force survey. So out of the country's 17 regions, BARM has the highest need incidence at 27%, uh, which means that 27% of youth in BARM are are need. And uh, the farm is followed by Davao region and Mimaropa at 20%, and Zamboanga Peninsula and Central Luzon, both at 19%. Uh, in terms of sex, females are more likely to be neat than males. So 24% of female youth are neat, compared to just 14% among male youth. And the NEAT incidence is even higher among females aged 20 to 24. Their NEAT incidence is 40%. And it's even higher among young married females uh, for whom the NEAT incidence is 67%. Uh, in terms of educational attainment, 70% of youth with a lower secondary education are NEAT. Uh, NEAT the NEAT incidence is actually lowest among youth with an upper secondary education at 9%, and it's highest among youth with uh, no educational attainment at 75%. Um, in terms of uh, geography, 19% of uh, the, the youth, the need incidence in rural areas is 19%, which is about the same as the need incidence in urban areas. 18 uh, percent and in terms of family income uh, need incidence is generally higher among youth belonging to poorer families so we found that 23 percent of youth in the bottom half of the income distribution are neat compared to just 11 percent among youth belonging to the top 20 percent of families okay so here we show the profile of filipino need uh, again, in we use uh, LFS data in 2019. So the overwhelming majority of them, 69%, are age 24. 53% of them are female. 43% have a lower secondary education. Over half, 56%, live in rural areas. And 56% come from the poorest 40% of families in terms of of income. Okay, so when we look at the economic status of need, uh, 
we see that most of them are economically inactive or out of the labor force, which means that they're neither working nor looking for work. So 74% of the need are out of the labor force. Uh, and we found also that 52% of, of need or over half of the need population consist, consists of economic, economically inactive females. And among the econo economically inactive need, the main reason for being economically inactive is home care. So 45% of the need are economically in inactive because uh, they are preoccupied with household or family duties. Uh, finally, over 60% of female need who are economically inactive are married. So this seems to say that uh, marriage and family formation have a lot to do with why female needs are not participating in the labor force. So next, we examine uh, where the youth drop out in the education ladder and where they go when they leave school. So to answer this question, we used uh, labor force survey data to see uh, education attendance rates at different ages. So this graph on the screen uh, shows school attendance rates from ages 5 to 24. And the orange curve that you see uh, represents overall attendance rates, while the colored curves beneath the orange curve represent school attendance rates at different education levels from primary to, to the bachelor level. So you will see that at ages 6 to 12, uh, which, corresponds to, which corresponds to the years when children are in primary education, school attendance among children is very high, averaging at, at nine, uh, 98%. From ages 12 to 16, uh, which corresponds to junior high school, school attendance starts to fall gradually. So from 98% at age 12, it falls to 92% at age 16. And after that, it falls at a much faster rate at age at ages 17 to 19, uh, which corresponds to senior high school and the transition to college. You see here that the school attendance falls from 92% at age 16 to 63% at age 19. And then after that, school attendance falls even faster at ages uh, 20 to 21, corresponding roughly to second year to fourth year college. So from 63% at age 19, school attendance drops to 21% at age 20, 21. Uh, so from age 22, school attendance continues to fall, but at a slower pace. And at age 24, only about 7% are left in school, most of them at the bachelor level. Okay, so next we try to answer the question of where the youth go when they leave school. So when youth leave school, they can either go to the labor force, meaning be employed or unemployed, or become inactive. So when we looked at the data, we found interesting differences between males and females when they transition out of school. So the first thing we found is that young males tend to leave school earlier, while young females tend to stay longer in school. So in this graph, the curves show the proportion of youth who are still in school by sex. The blue curve represents males and the pink curve represents females. We see that at ages uh, 5, 15 to 19, uh, education participation among females is higher compared to males, although that difference disappears at age 20, and after that, the gap actually reverses. So the second thing we found is that males transition to work earlier and in larger proportions than females. That is shown in the graph here. So we see here that at earliest age 15, percent of male youth are already in school. At the expected senior age, JP, can you check your audio, please, your microphone? We can no longer hear you. Can you speak again?
there's no sound coming out, unfortunately. Hello. Yes, yes, it's okay now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Should I go yes. back to where was I? Where did I lose my my? Uh, on? You can start this slide, GP. This slide. What? The the one in the slide now, male, female. Uh, for, Should uh, work. Yeah. Good. Okay, so as I was saying before, uh, I lost the connection. Uh, the second thing we found is that males transition to work earlier and in larger proportions than females. That's shown in the graph here. So we see here that as early as age 15, 10% uh, of male youth are already employed compared to 7%. And uh, as we expect as youth age, uh, a larger and larger share of youth become employed. But that gap between males and females persists. And if you see beginning at age 21, that gap widen. So that at age 24, three out of four male youth are employed, but only half of the females at that age are employed. So finally, we found that when youth uh, when youth leave school, a larger share of female youth transition to being economically inactive compared to males. So that is shown in the graph here. So at ages uh, 15 and 16, the share of youth who are out of the labor force is basically identical for both sexes. That changes starting age 17 when a gap starts to appear and that gap continues to widen until age 24. And when youth reach that age, nearly 40% of female youth are inactive compared to just under 10% of male youth. Okay, so next, uh, in this section, we turn to the question of how government agencies measure and monitor well, first, we discuss the role of the Philippine Statistics Authority or the PSA in measuring the country's NEET population. So the PSA publishes official statistics on NEET using data collected from the Labor Force Survey. And the LFS used to be done quarterly but has been uh, done monthly since January 2021. Uh, so the LFS, the LFS collects data on four variables that are used to identify need. These are age, employment, education participation, meaning if a person is attending school, and training participation, meaning if a person is attending a training program. So actually the question on training participation was introduced in the LFS only in its July 2018 round. So from so from uh, 2006 to 2018, what the PSA only has is data on the NEE, or the new Youth Not in Employment or Education. And they only started publishing data on NEET in, in 2019, just uh, about three years ago. Okay, so uh, in our review of PSA survey manuals, we found that the way that the PSA defines training participation is quite narrow and different from the way TESDA defines training participation. So based on PSA survey materials, only people who are attending school-based event programs are considered as participating in training. Uh, for TESDA, however, TVET TVET programs can be delivered in a variety of ways. Uh, TVET can be delivered through institutions such as uh, TVIs, technical vocational institutions, uh, through enterprises such as apprenticeship or learnership programs, through community-based programs, and through so-called uh, monitored programs. These are training programs delivered by uh, government agencies. So if we take a look at the pie chart on the right, uh, based on tested data, 
two-thirds of enrollees in TVET programs in 2019 were actually taking TVET programs outside of institutional providers. So 45% a community-based program and 18% took a, took a monitored program. So because of PSA's definition of training, because PSA's definition of training participation is narrower than TESTAS, it is possible that PSA is undercounting or underestimating the true extent of training participation in the country. Okay, so now we turn to the result of our interviews with government agencies. So we interviewed offices in uh, DOLE, TESDA, CHED, DEPED, DSWD, and the NYC. Uh, specifically, we interviewed offices that run education, employment, or training programs and other programs that target the youth. Okay, so we asked uh, government offices whether they use the NEED concept, and we found that only two agencies, DOLE and TESDA, use this concept. And that's because these are the only two agencies that have programs that specifically uh, target NEED. For DOLE, that is the SPES, the Special Program for the Employment of Students. And according to TESDA, they're Seek, find, train, assess, certify, employer framework uh, targets the youth need. And we also asked government, government agencies whether they monitor need. And although all of them keep track of the beneficiaries of their program, only Dole said that they monitor need statistics from the PSA. All right, so next we discuss how we answer the question of how many need are how many need youth are potential Tibet learners. So we try to answer that question by estimating a regression model that predicts training participation using data from the PSA's labor force survey and the annual poverty indicator survey. Uh, so in this presentation, we're only going to show a simplified representation of uh, the, the methodology we used, and those who are interested in the details may refer to, to our paper. So basically what we do is estimate a regression model of training participation on a subsample of youth who are not neat. And this model says that training participation is influenced or determined by individual characteristics like like uh, age, sex, and education, uh, family characteristics like family size, education of parents, uh, community characteristics uh, such as where a person lives, whether it is urban or rural. And after estimating the model, we then apply it to a subsample of the neat youth to predict which among the neat youth would participate in a training based on these characteristics. Okay, so we checked how well the model performs in predicting uh, training participation among it doesn't JP, there's a, there's a problem again with your microphone. <laughs> Okay. Can you speak again and then uh, repeat from this slide? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, you can hear you. Right. I'm using the my computer's mic now. Do I pick up from this slide? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. So, as I said, we checked how well the model performs in predicting training participation among non-need youth. And unfortunately, the model doesn't perform very well. Of all the training participants, it only correctly identifies 32% of them as training participants. So when we apply this model on the subsample of need youth, the model predicts about 25% of need 
or close to 1 million youth as training participants. Okay, so finally, for the first study, we discussed the barriers that keep NEET from pursuing TVET. So we answered this question by means of an online survey. So our target respondents were current trainees and applicants in Testnet Technology Institutes or TTIs, and current trainees and applicants in youth work in YouthWorks PH, the program of of, of, of PBED. So in terms of eligibility, anyone among these target groups were eligible to, to participate in the survey as long as they were neat at the time of their application to the program. Uh, so in terms of sampling, we uh, collected, the way we collected responses is we asked TESDA and YouthWorks to advertise the survey and promote it among their constituents. And we ask them to collect as many responses as they can. So our survey is a self-selected survey, meaning anyone who was willing to participate in it could do so as long as they were eligible. And this means that our sampling method is not uh, non-random and non-probability. And uh, also that means the sample is not representative of the need population or even the need population in test that technology institutes or youth works ph and that means that our findings are not the findings of the survey are not generalizable but uh, nevertheless despite this limitation we still think that our results are informative so our survey was conducted in march 2021 and uh, the usable sample size we achieved is 1,688, and most of them, 61%, consists of trainees in Tesla Technology Institutes. Okay, so we asked uh, respondents to name factors that kept them from pursuing TVET before they applied for training, and we allowed them to name more than one factor, and uh, these were their top responses. So the top reason is financial. 48% said that the reason they didn't pursue TVET was the lack of funds for money or tuition. Lack of funds for, for uh, tuition or allowance, I mean. So that is followed by the lack of information, 13%, uh, and household or caring duties, 11%, and working or seeking work at 10%. Interestingly, 36% uh, said they didn't experience any, any hindrance from pursuing TVET and perhaps uh, some of these people didn't pursue TVET because it was their choice uh, not to. Okay, so we also asked respondents about uh, the types of support that they think are needed in order to encourage youth to pursue TVET. And these are the top responses that they gave. So 58% said uh, allowance support, 56% said information on jobs, 48% uh, said tuition support, 47% said job search support, and 39% said information on TVET programs. Okay, so, so those were the findings, the main findings of the first study. Now we turn to the findings of the second study on the training landscape in the Philippines. Okay, so uh, the first part is about the available training programs in youth works, PH priority sectors, which are construction, manufacturing, and tourism. Okay, so based on our review of Test the data and documents. We found that there are many tech talk programs in construction, tourism, and manufacturing that lead to a national certificate qualification. So, as of the time that we wrote the paper, there were 43 in construction, example, carpentry NC2, tile setting NC2. NC2. Uh, there were 21 in tourism, for example, uh, bread and pastry NC2. And there were 104 in manufacturing. So actually the way we counted the 
training programs in manufacturing is different from the way we counted the programs in the other two sectors. But for a discussion of that, we will just refer you to our paper. So tourism related programs are actually the most widely offered programs by training schools. So in based on test the data from 2019, 27% of all TechVoc programs that are registered to TESDA are in the tourism sector. And the other programs in the top five are metals engineering, electrical and electronics, social community development and other services, and construction. And actually tourism programs are also the most demanded by, by students. So this graph shows that 10 Tibet sectors with the highest number of graduates in 2019. Um, tourism programs account for 23% of all Tibet graduates of all ages and 30% of all Tibet graduates who are youth. And the other sectors with a high concentration of youth graduates are electrical and electronics, automotive and land transportation, metals and engineering, and ICT. So for this question and the other remaining questions, we use the responses that we gathered from our interviews with companies that run training programs. So as uh, we said earlier, we conducted the uh, informant interviews for this paper. Uh, two of the companies that were in, we interviewed were engaged in construction. Uh, one is a canning company, while the other is a hotel company. Uh, so two of these companies have an in-house training school, while the other two companies have an, an, an apprenticeship program. And most of these uh, companies employ their graduates after, after they graduate from their training. So for this uh, section of the paper, we asked respondents to talk about the issues on the responsiveness of existing training programs to industry needs. And this is the synthesis of their responses. Okay, so the first concern has to do with the low demand for construction related trainings among the youth. So the construction companies we interviewed said that they find it hard to find students for their training programs, even with the offer of free tuition and a guaranteed job after passing the assessment. And they said this is because young people don't have a favorable view of construction jobs. Uh, they find construction jobs as dirty, dangerous, difficult, and dead end. And in general, more young people prefer tourism over construction training programs. Uh, so the second issue is on the subject of allowances and government scholarships. So our respondents said that they tap government scholarships to finance their programs, for example, TESDAS, TWSP, and TESFA, and DepEd's uh, JDVP, the Joint Delivery Voucher Program. Uh, so they said that the scholarships are barely enough to cover program costs, which include trainer salaries and trainer materials. And there's also the issue of allowances. So one provider said that they tap uh, test the TWSP with free tuition but no allowance. Uh, they said that many potential students are unwilling to undergo training because of the absence of an allowance to support them in the course of the training. So actually TESDA already added an allowance benefit to the TWSP at the time we conducted the interview. So probably the respondent was talking about a, a previous experience. So the third issue is about the lack of soft skills among entry level workers. So one informant said that many of their entry level workers do not advance at work because they lack communication skills and discipline. And then another informant said that they noticed that uh, younger workers tend to fall short on discipline and compliance to superiors. And they also said that their jobs are relatively easy to learn and what they need are are workers who are disciplined and willing to follow instructions. Uh, finally, there is the issue of workers leaving the company after gaining skills and some experience. Some of the respondents said that many workers leave their company to work in bigger cities or leave the country to work overseas after gaining qualifications as well as experience. 
And this means that these companies always need to train new workers to fill the gap left by those who, who leave the company. Okay, so next we discuss our respondents' answers to the question of whether there is demand for new national certificates or training regulations. So when we asked our respondents whether there is demand for new qualifications in their sector, only one only one of them cited a specific area, which is uh, prefabricated construction in the construction sector. Uh, what uh, most respondents actually brought attention to is, or are, are other issues surrounding uh, training regulations, and and we discuss those issues here. So the first one is on the need to update. Uh, training regulations for existing training programs. So some respondents thought that these training regulations or TRs are not being are not up to speed with with uh, current industry practices or technologies and need to be updated. For example, one respondent claimed that TRs for some programs still prescribe the use of of uh, outdated tools. Uh, the second is on the issue of the training of, uh, or, or of the, the issue of the quality of the training schools. So some informants observed that uh, some TVIs lack equipment and facilities that are up to par with industry standards. And these include PESDAS, uh, Provincial Training Centers, or PTCs. And they said that this results in graduates who lack the required skills when they and they become employed. Okay, so the next concern has to do with uh, trainers and assessors. So one of our informants believed that trainers in TVIs tend to be not industry-based and therefore they are not up to date with the latest uh, industry practices and technologies. And then another informant suggested that TESTA should immediately accredit industry practitioners to, to become trainers and assessors and no longer require them to undergo training assess and assessment, which is the current practice. So uh, in response, Tesla said that they require prospective assessors and trainers to undergo training and assessment so that they can learn how to teach and assess, basically because they said that teaching and assessment uh, requires uh, specific skills. And uh, when we reviewed test the documents, we found that industry experience is actually already a requirement to be a trainer or assessor, although being a current industry practitioner is, is, not, is not a requirement. Okay, so the final concern has to do with, with industry voice and dialogue between and dialogue between industry and the government. So one of our respondents suggested that there should be regular dialogue between, between industry and training providers and the government so that industry can better con convey their, their specific needs. Okay, so finally, uh, we discussed the responses of our informants when we asked them to uh, discuss the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on their training programs and what and what industry sectors emerged because of COVID-19. Okay, so uh, both of the respondents that run an in-house training school said that they were forced to suspend all face-to-face -face classes due to community quarantine measures. Uh, on the other hand, two other respondents with an apprenticeship program were able to continue their apprenticeship programs because their businesses remained open, although they have had to reduce their, their apprentices to maintain social distancing and because they're, they were working at a, at a limited capacity. So because face-to-face uh, -face classes were suspended, some of our respondents said that they converted the theory component of their training modules into videos or electronic materials that their students can access online. And this has allowed their students to, to continue learning remotely. Although the same couldn't be done for practical skills because teaching practical skills requires hands-on activities in the lab or in the workplace, which at the time of our interviews remained closed. 
And another, uh, another limitation of online learning is that it is hindered by the lack of access of students to the internet or to digital devices, especially students among low-income families. So when we, uh, when we asked our respondents whether the pandemic has created demand for new skills or jobs, uh, these are the jobs or skills that were mentioned. So first is uh, auxiliary nursing services. So one of our informants said that they were pi piloting an auxiliary nursing services program which produces qualified nursing assistants and their objective is to help fill demand for for nursing assistants in the in the hospitals. Uh, the next is digital skills. So some respondents mentioned uh, digital skills, especially because transactions are now shifting online and digital marketing skills can also allow uh, companies to promote their products online. And then finally, another respondent uh, mentioned the need for students to learn how to self-learn or to learn on their own. So it was said that students need to be trained to be more responsible for their own education, which becomes useful when teachers cannot be physically present, such as in a pandemic. Uh, so in terms of subsectors that have emerged due to the pandemic, only one was mentioned by any of our respondents, and that is online food selling in the hospitality, hospitality sector. And it was mentioned that Home cooking has cost advantages that make it more competitive compared to restaurants because overhead is lower and for, um, because um, and because of that, people with cooking skills can take advantage of 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 these skills and put up their their online business. Okay, so that's it for the findings. I'm now uh, turning it back to. Turning it over back to, to Dr. Arbeta. Next slide, please. So uh, I, I'll run uh, through the conclusions just to remind you about what JP has said and, and, and perhaps dwell a little bit more on the recommendations. So the first one is that uh, uh, in terms of the profile of the youth need, uh, 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 the incidence as you have, uh, have been is very is highest in Barm, followed by Davao region, Mimarupa, Sabonga Peninsula, and Central Luzon. Then uh, need, uh, needs are mostly female and tend to come from poorer families. And the need are needs are uh, mostly economically economically inactive, with home care as being the principal reason for the inactivity. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, school attendance uh, drops out significantly uh, during ages 17 to 21, and males tend to leave school earlier and start work earlier than females. A large share of the female uh, leaving school become econ economically inactive. Next slide, please. Uh, few government uh, agencies currently use the NEET concept, and PSC's definition of training participation excludes non-school-based modes of delivery, uh, likely undercounting the training participants. Next slide, please. Uh, when we uh, try to predict uh, how many of these uh, new needs uh, using a model, uh, and we uh, there are problems with the model, but the, the model predicts 25% of the needs will are potentially to be learners or about one, 1 million youth. And, and we should be uh, taking these results uh, because of the uh, issues with the model and perhaps we can improve the model with better data next time. Next slide, please. Uh, the survey brief also found that the uh, financial constraints uh, is, is mentioned as the main barriers for pursuing uh, that prevents uh, needs from pursuing TVET, uh, followed by lack of information and housework. Uh, financial support, including tuition and allowance, and information on jobs and TVET programs can help uh, also encourage training participation among the youth and 
the survey findings, uh, however, it's not generalizable because we didn't do a probability sampling. It was impossible during that time. We didn't have a, a, a frame. Uh, but uh, these are uh, informative as well, uh, nonetheless. So in terms of recommendation, uh, we we thought that uh, we should uh, do more in-depth studies on determinants of the youth needs. Uh, I, uh, for instance, why are uh, female going into inactivity when they leave training or uh, school? Uh, and uh, that that's one issue that has to be. Uh, you, you need to find a good data on, on why, uh, and and identify the policies that will draw them into either training if the uh, if they don't don't continue with a regular school, maybe they can go into training, but that they don't do that or or employed. Then what can keep them employed is us. So those are issues that has to be uh, uh, stressed out and with better data. And then so we, and, and and because most as I said, while males go to work, females don't. Uh, they just, when they leave school, they become economically kind of inactive. Neither. Uh, they don't pursue training nor, nor did they work. So that's essentially uh, the issue with uh, females who leave school. Okay, uh, and uh, PSCN test that has should need to resolve uh, needs to resolve the difference in definition about training participation because as now uh, as we have uh, JP has mentioned that the current definition of PSA. Uh, uh, undercounts the number of those who are in training by about almost 45 percent because these are not they don't count those who are not trained in 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 uh, in uh, in universities or or uh, and uh, and uh, community-based training programs these are big uh, components of of uh, tester training so that's that's one thing that has to be resolved and uh, uh, we need to promote the uh, need concept among the relevant government agencies because that, that's as, as we have mentioned at the beginning this is a big cost of society for uh, our youth not to be in either training or employment uh, and be and being active so encourage also the participation uh, uh, through financial support we have, which we have been doing and maybe we should uh, information dissemination and employment facilitation assistance. These are the things that are mentioned by those who are saying that uh, uh, why they were not able to pursue the training. So that, these are what has been mentioned. Yeah, we know that we have been doing a lot of financial support uh, for. Uh, so perhaps we should uh, do a little bit with no one's no one seeing where we should be putting our money so that we can improve uh, participation and training for our youth who are not in training, education, uh, or uh, in employment. Next slide, please. So for the second study, there are uh, uh, the uh, Tibet trainings are in tourism as, as, as the biggest construction and manufacturing leading to a national certificate. Uh, and that the industry concerns are about lack of demand of certain training, especially for construction. As this had said, uh, financing is not uh, enough in the, the construction industry. Uh, because there are already programs for construction, but they are still uh, low take care. So there needs to be more, more things to be done to, to be uh, uh, done in order to improve the demand for for training for construction. Uh, train uh, for construction. Uh, the other thing that is mentioned is uh, up to dateness of trainees, assessors, and training schools, and training curricula to the industry practices. So the, basically, this is based more uh, synchronization between industry and the training uh, institutions so that they will be uh, uh, updating each other on what's needed by 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 the firms uh, the other thing important as mentioned is the inadequate skills among the even if uh, we are training for skills communications is very important work uh, attitudes and uh, discipline are very important as well so those kinds of uh, have to be uh, given importance besides the skill itself of, 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 uh, uh, of whatever they are being trained for. So this uh, people call this transversal skills that needs to be uh, inculcated as well together with the skills. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
rather than a new insist uh, it appears that the, the the need is for updating training regulations improving the quality of training schools and tapping industry practitioners as trainers and successors to basically solve the problem of uh, 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 lack of sync synchronization between training in, 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 and, and, and practice and enhancing the industry dialogue. I think there is a, already a move of the uh, industry boards at, at the local levels that will perhaps be a venue for all of this uh, dialogue that will uh, improve the synchronization between training institutes and, 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 and firms. The COVID-19 has forced some to shift uh, uh, to uh, online training, but it's effectively limited by lack of practical training and lack of internet services. That's basically uh, one of the problems that uh, throughout the education sector that we have data for. Uh, that uh, lack of uh, uh, connection is in in households is the one that prevents us from 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 uh, pushing really online training. Even if we are capable, if our schools are capable, our households are not appears to be prepared from the data that we we we, we can find. Pandemic has created demand for nursing assistance and digital skills and boosted online counseling. For the last slide, uh, next slide please, is for recommendations. Uh, the pursuit of information campaigns for to improve the image of construction jobs, and that's, that's, as I have said, you already have financing for that, but there are no, no takers, so there, there needs to be something else that has to be done besides financing for construction. Review the content of training in view of the strengthening of soft skills and formation. So that's, that's, that's the other thing that has to be emphasized. So it's not just the dexterity of the hand on things that we do, but also the agility the preparedness of the mind and the attitudes towards work and and, and communicating what 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 we want to do what they need for instance is the other thing that perhaps the employers are looking for and top industry practitioners practitioners as trainers and assessors and pro promote uh, exposure of school based trainers and assessors to industry practices so the basically the greater synchronization between schools and and firms invest in flexible learning training modalities yeah uh, uh, for training providers with due consideration the access to limitations of target training. So uh, uh, some can be done in flexible online learning, but we have to understand that there are limitations from our client side that we have to understand. Even if our schools are prepared, maybe our client is not. So we have to bridge that, that gap. Uh, there are many examples for it, like for example, PBED has experimented on lending tablets to trainees. Uh, uh, because uh, during the time of the pandemic, and that's the only way they, uh, they were able to participate and providing them loads to be able to access. And pro finally, promote regular dialogue between, this is always a, a very, uh, in terms of, because of the rapid change in technology, uh, there should be always a, a con conversation between employers and, 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 and trainers and government uh, and trying to know how to help that conversation to, to continue. And, and so that the synchronization between training institutions and and and, and firms is 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 is, is, is always high and and and, and be uh, 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 helping each other uh, provide the needs of of the industry. I think that's the last uh, recommendation, JP. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Erbeta and uh, JP, for your uh, clear and uh, comprehensive presentation. So, friends, uh, let's continue the conversation. And this time, we will hear from our invited experts on their comments and insights. So, our first discussant is from uh, the Technical Education and Skills Development Authority, or TESDA, which, as we all know, is the main government agency in the country that says that uh, the direction and manages programs for technical education and skills development. And we are honored to have with us the Executive Director of the Planning Office of TESDA, Ms. Uh, Rosalina uh, Constantino, her extensive um, career in government, which spans uh, 20 years, enabled her to gain significant knowledge and experience on technical uh, vocational education and training management and quality management systems. She finished her undergraduate degree at the University of Santo Tomas and eventually earned a master's degree in government management at the Pamantasan and Lunsod ng Maynila. Friends, I now give you Executive Director Rosalina Constantino of TESDA. Ma'am, you have the virtual floor. Thank you, Sheila. 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to present our inputs and comments on the two policy studies presented by PIDS earlier. Um, in behalf of Secretary La Peña and DDG Rose Ordaneta, TESDA is very grateful to PIDS and PBED for undertaking these research initiatives towards better policy and event implementation with us. Our deepest gratitude to Dr. Orbeta, Mr. Corpus, and of course, Ms. Love Basiliote. The study is entitled, Who are the Youth Need in the Philippines Today? And the profile of training and skilling programs in the Philippines shed light to the current situation of Tibet provision on both the demand and supply ends. These also provided valuable inputs that will help us and our key stakeholders in formulating and coming up with Tibet's, Tibet policies and programs for the youth need in the Philippines. Let me lay down our comments on the first study, the one that did with TESDA, um, entitled Who are the Youth Need in the Philippines Today? This study cited that the bulk of our youth are need, mo most are female, female in rural areas and some are in the poorest 40% of the families. The youth need is a potential Tibet clientele and is needed to be identified and defined properly by relevant national government agencies that cater to these clients, including TESDA. Looking closer into their characteristics in better definition and parameters will help the agency identify possible interventions needed. While TESDA already implements and maps its potential clients that include them, the agency supports the study's findings in setting better parameters in measuring the youth need incidents in the country, in the LFS, and in coming up with standard definition among NGAs to have better understanding and more holistic in the approach and interventions. Regular dialogues with all involved NGAs, especially the Philippine Statistics Authority and other stakeholders, should also be a priority. The standard definition and parameters will help better establish policies and programs specific to the youth need. We believe that programs that specifically target the youth need should be established among these relevant agencies. TESDA also advocates for the conduct of more research anchored Tibet policies. So we also push for partnerships with other organizations such as the PITS in conducting in-depth studies to better look into the said issues and challenges in need, in line with the agency's roles in providing quality skills training and other Tibet programs. On another note, regarding the study's finding on higher incidence of need and economic inactivity among female youth, TESDA also welcomes collaborative initiatives with other key agencies such as the Department of Education, Commission on Higher Education, the Department of Labor and Employment, and the Philippine Commission on Women to empower our women through training, livelihood, and education. We hope to extend our Tibet programs to the youth need in the future. Moving forward, TESDA acknowledges the challenges that prohibit the youth need to take up training as found in the study. The agency, guided by, it, by its mandate, will address these accordingly. However, we would like to impart the following initiatives TESDA has already launched last year in response to Tibet delivery, especially geared for the new normal and beyond in relation to the following barriers. First, on tuition and allowances. Second, access. And third, information on Tibet programs. As discussed in the paper, TESDA offers several scholarship programs applicable to most of the Tibet clientele that includes the youth need. All of these scholarship uh, scholarships have at least 350 pesos allowance for each training. In addition to this, in view of the pandemic, an additional 500 pesos health and protective equipment allowance and 500 pesos internet allowance were included as part of the benefits. Registration for these scholarship programs are readily available in the TESDA website and official social uh, media pages and in regional and provincial offices of the agency. While on the issue of access, 
TESDA implements a wide variety of event programs nationwide and in different delivery modes. At the start of the pandemic, TESDA has been at the forefront of ensuring the continuity of education through the flexible, flexible learning delivery. We have crafted the OPLA TESDA about lahat, Tibet towards the new normal, which is our Tibet continuity plan. And part of that is the flexible le learning delivery. The FLD as a policy has changed how training is conducted from the traditional delivery mode. The flexible learning delivery offers alternatives to face-to-face -to -face training, not just to comply with the restrictions of the pandemic, but in re recognition of the various needs of individuals, industries, and communities. So this flexible learning delivery is composed of online learning, blended, distance learning, face-to-face, -face, and the combination of uh, these different learning modalities. With TESDA's flexible learning delivery, greater access and consideration in Tibet provision is given to trainees in view of the new norm. Online learning and upskilling significantly played important roles as people around the world embrace the new normal as well. Digitalization has accelerated as a way for the education and training sector to respond to the challenges brought about by the pandemic. As the year ended, the TESDA online program served almost 100,000 registered users that mostly completed their online training to support and make sure that learners have more access to the new system, TESDA has also developed the TOP mobile app available in Apple and Google App Stores. With the TOP app, learners can download and learn offline and sync their progress when they have internet access. These innovations in e-learning and flexible arrangements make Tibet more accessible, inclusive, and sustainable, and more agile even during social disruptions and changing landscapes. And for those in the far-flung areas, TESDA continues to extend its training programs through the mobile training laboratories that reach even the remotest areas in the country. TESDA also offers enterprise-based training to its trainees co-implemented with the industry's company partners of the agency. Not only will the, these training programs upskill the need, this can also bring the opportunities for employment in the companies they are training in. Looking into the primary motivations of Tibet trainees, which are to learn tech book skills and to get a job or a livelihood after, we also found that these also match Tesla's mantra or our guiding principle, TESDA Abot Lahat. Just this 2021, despite the quarantine restrictions, we were able to produce over a million graduates from different parts of the country from all walks of life. We intend to increase that number from this year onwards. TESDA has a number of efforts disseminating information about our event programs too. We maximize our of official social media pages through Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter to educate our stakeholders and potential Tibet clientele about available training programs, assessment and certification, scholarships, and the like. Press releases and other media engagements that publicize events and projects on Tibet development are also utilized. The agency has also been conducting the National Tibet Enrollment Day for several, several years now, to promote and advocate various TESDA programs and services and expand access to TESDA programs to a wide range of clientele. The National Tibet Enrollment, Enrollment Day initiated some simultaneous application for free tech book, okay, uh, tech book training for everyone. These are only some of the ways TESDA tries to extend Tibet to empower our youth need. Using Dr. Erbeta and Mr. Corpus' study, TESDA hopes to come up with other programs and policies that will specifically target these stakeholders in the future. Going now to the next study on the profile of training and skilling programs in the Philippines, co-developed with the Philippine Business for Education, we would like to share that in terms of the study's finding on lack of training programs in the priority sectors, TESDA already took a step forward identifying the skills requirements in the eight priority sectors included in the National TSD plan. 
These are agriculture, electronics, health and wellness, ITPPM, manufacturing, tourism, transportation, communications, and logistics, and of course, construction. TESDA, guided by the National TSD Plan, intends to boost the supply of quality skilled workers in these sectors to meet the expanding demands of industries in a growing economy. TESDA will continue to advocate for the provision and conduct of more construction-related training programs all over the country, among other priority sectors too. These, uh, there are already existing media materials posted on TESDA platforms that promote skills training for the youth, called from the success stories of real Tibet graduates, especially in the non-traditional trades. TESDA is also working on making the Philippine Construct Constructors Association to be one of its recognized industry boards to further the advocacy in promoting construction-related skills training programs. We also strengthen our labor market information capacity by conducting skills needs anticipation studies and implementing the area-based and demand-driven Tibet framework in the field. With these, TESDA makes sure that the training programs we produce are in line with the current and future skills needs of the industry. The results of the National TSD Plan Action Programming and the SNA are relevant inputs in the continuous quality assured policy making and program development and implementation of TESDA so that we can deliver better Tibet services to our Kababayans. Further, we can collaborate with different industry partners and associations in this campaign. TESDA, after all, in a bid to be more area-based and demand-driven, wants to better identify the industry skills needs to aid in training program development in identified areas. The study also found that there are numerous Tibet financing programs among government and pro, uh, private organizations that seem repetitive and confusing. In connection with coming up with a standard definition and better parameters to measure youth need statistics, talks regarding harmonization of programs for the youth need between NGAs and relevant stakeholders is advisable. There is also regular uh, review of the Tibet standards as spearheaded by the TESA Qualifications and Standards Office, made up of industry and Tibet practitioners or expert uh, panel members. We also strengthen our labor market information um, capacity by conducting the skills needs anticipation studies. With these tests to make sure that the training programs we produce are in line with the current and future skills needs of the industries. While with the suggestion of tapping industry practitioners as trainers and assessors, this further promotes industry exposure to training. In addition to enterprise-based and other industry partnership training provisions, TESDA is one in forwarding advocacies in capacitating these industry practitioners with proper Tibet teaching skills through the in-company training programs. And finally, among the most relevant recommendations in the paper was to promote regular dialogue between the government employers and Tibet providers. TESDA calls on the, the national government agencies involved in providing better access to employment, education, and training to our youth to convene and start working on addressing these identified needs of the youth. These concerns and issues may be further discussed in the interagency committee of our national TSD plan, wherein the sectoral concerns are being addressed and monitored. That's it for me today. We welcome um, questions in the open forum later. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, E.D. Rosalina Constantino of, um, of uh, TESDA. Uh, we appreciate your uh, reactions to the study as well as uh, your updates on uh, what uh, TESDA has done so far to uh, respond to the study's uh, findings and recommendations. Okay. So um, our next discussion is from uh, the Philippine Business uh, for Education. 
or PBED, a nonprofit founded in 2006 by top CEOs in the country as the business community's response to the need for greater education and economy alignment. Joining us again is none other than uh, PBED's Executive Director, Ms. Love Bas Basiliote. Executive Director Basiliote is a human capital development and education specialist with significant experience in nonprofit management, program management, public policy, and communications. Aside from leading PBED, she is also an independent director of a fintech startup, and she has a master's degree from Harvard University and bachelor's degree in political science from the Ateneo de Manila University. E.D. Basiliote, the floor is now yours. Thanks, Sheila. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to greet you all, especially the authors. Um, and presenters of the two studies, and also my fellow panelists. I'd also like to thank. Uh, I'd also like to, to thank um, our partners at USAID, TESDA, and our private sector partners for their support in the implementation of YouthWorks Philippines, our private sector-driven youth training and employability project. Without them, we would not have been able to, in turn, support such meaningful research. Dr. Babes, John, and Nina, thank you for sharing such important work with all of us today. On behalf of PBED YouthWorks, I'd like to express our appreciation for the work that you have put into these two research partnerships. Maraming salamat. Can we just give them a round of applause before I proceed with my reactions? I don't know if you can do it, but maybe you can do it in, your, in the safety of your homes or wherever you are in the world. Um, Okay, I'll do it. Great. Thank you. Maraming salamat. I want to anchor my remarks today on the three reasons why I think these two pieces of research are important in the overall systemic reform of workforce development and youth empowerment in the country. First, I am really happy to have systemic data and systematic data on youth need. So there is a common management adage that I subscribe to, which says, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. In this case, the data presented to us today give us relevant information on who and where the youth are, what's, what constraints they face, and what interventions, training programs are in place so that we can properly manage the system and ultimately help them. I won't run through all of the results of the two studies, and I also won't run through all of our programs and you know, pivots or responses to, to the recommendations. But let me just share, um, as a human capital development specialist, which data points jumped at me when I read the, the report. Number one, the youth excluded from education, training, and employment opportunities are youth who identify as women. They live in rural areas, they come from poorer backgrounds, they are married with children, and they don't get past lower secondary education. Number two, there are many programs that exist, um, although they know they need upgrading, um, um, improvement, but the youth are not accessing them because of many reasons, but primarily financial reasons, um, and specific to what we call in workforce development, wrap around costs um, to training like transportation, allowance while doing training, and lack of information and home caring responsibilities. And number three, the number of out of school youth and um, out of school and training and unemployed youth might be overstated because government agencies have def have different definitions. Actually, not just government agencies, but many sectors. No. So secondly, um, given what we know, and this is why, again, I'm thankful, we now have better guidance as to what we can and should do to truly empower the youth to invest in themselves and lead productive lives. So rather than despairing over the seemingly mountain of constraints and problems preventing us from empowering the youth, I instead see possibilities and opportunities especially as we're trying to continue learning and human capital investment in the midst of a still raging pandemic. So this is a cause for hope, right? And let me share what these opportunities are using entrepreneurship's principles of effectuation, which is kind of like a logic of thinking to help one start a business. And, and it's also a framework to guide action, especially in an unpredictable future. So 
we know with for um, fire, with a with pandemic, the future is really unpredictable. So it has kind of five elements. So bird in hand, it, it, we start with our means. The second one is affordable loss. So focusing on what we can afford to lose or what are the downside risks. The third element is lemonade, which is you know leveraging con contingency. So rather than you know, wallowing on what doesn't work, we use those um, contingencies to actually make lemonade out of lemons, right? Um, patchwork quilt, which is focusing on forming partnerships. And the last is pilot in the plane, which focuses on what we can predict. So given the information that um, Dr. Orbeta, John, and Nina presented, um, and the programs that at, are an, at hand, which actually um, Executive Director Constantino shared also, so which is our bird in hand, right? We can start by asking ourselves who are working in this field. Are our interventions reaching those who need them the most? We can focus our interventions and redefine existing ones to really target the youth in poor and rural communities who are women with home care responsibilities. We saw similar data actually in the course of implementation of YouthWorks. And so what we are doing in YouthWorks now is to provide wraparound services like transportation allowance, dormitory allowance, and we're offering this to our strategic partnerships or partners to encourage more young women to train in construction jobs, which are high demand even during the pandemic. We know that training is directly and indirectly expensive. Our estimates in youth works across professions in construction, ICT, tourism, and manufacturing show that a youth trainee needs a, a median of about 15,000 to 20,000 pesos for a two to three months training for the wrap around cost to training. So this also already includes mga um, COVID uh, tests, etc. So we see this as an opportunity to pivot our interventions so that they fill the emerging gaps that's, that actually spell the difference between attrition and completion. Um, from the studies, we also know that there is an overestimation of the number of youth, <clears throat> youth need. So one question that policy and decision makers can probably ask is, should our training scholarship programs go wide or deep? Unpopular, but, may but maybe we can afford to limit the number of scholarship programs, but increase the amount of the scholarship programs to increase the support um, that we give our youth so that we ensure their completion and we facilitate employment. Um, just a short note on the three other aspects of this effectuation principle, which are, you know, lemonade, patchwork quilt, and pilot in the plane. Mobility restrictions can be used to increase the use of maybe, you know, technology um, like virtual reality or uh, augmented reality training for dangerous, dirty, dead end, and difficult professions that are also high demand and high paying to increase um, we can also use these restrictions to increase partnerships with the private sector and these restrictions to create programs that are demanded by industry. So basically, the, the, the crisis that we are in now, the pandemic that we are in now, we use the, 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 the difficulties we are facing in order for us to actually um, scale our interventions through partnerships, levering technology um, and updating our programs. And third, and the last reason why I'm truly thankful for this research is the dose of humility it is giving all of us. For us to truly empower the youth, we need to rethink our existing biases, go back to the drawing board and improve our programs. YouthWorks included, and, and um, I hope government programs too. We are so focused on credentials when data shows that employers don't look for that. They'd rather hire someone who knows how to do the job and can professionally work with other people than someone with an NC. So what's stopping us from rethinking the NC to facilitate transition from training to employment? Scholarships and training programs are developed without taking into consideration the context in which our youth beneficiaries are in. So rather than thinking of training in a vacuum, we need to focus our attention to these needs right, these wraparound costs like transpo, home care, and informing them of the training and the benefits of training so that we actually can encourage more youth to participate in training. 
and some of the questions that you know are running through my head now like um should we pivot towards programs that truly prepare the youth who need them the most and focus on depth and away from our kind of like spray and pray programs spray and pray meaning you know you would just like throw out whatever programs are at them and pray that they work and and the youth actually you know um take advantage of them um we know that partnerships work. We should perhaps double down on building these partnerships to be of better service to future generations. Um, there are so many other things I want to talk about, but yeah, I just wanted to 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 basically focus my my remarks today by thanking the research team and thanking all of you for being part of this of this um, discussion. Um, I'll stop here for now. Happy to answer questions during the open forum. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Edie Basiliote, um, for your thought-provoking uh, remarks, always in point. We'll hear more from you during the um, open forum. So, uh, okay, let's now uh, uh, go to our uh, last um, discussion. Okay, so friends, um, for a balanced discussion, we also invited a tech voc or TVET provider to get uh, first-hand insights on uh, <laughs> delivering tech block education, the challenges they face, and the issues confronting uh, the learners based on their interaction with them and their insights also on uh, the needs of the industry. It is our pleasure to have with us uh, Ms. Paulette, Paulette Liu, the President and Chief Operating Officer of the Primary Structures Educational Foundation Incorporated. School of Knowledge for Industrial Labor Leadership and Service, or PSEFI Skills, um, the foundation of the primary group of builders, a family-owned construction company based in Cebu. Ms. Liu, who also serves as PGB Senior Vice President for Human Resources and Administration, is a psychology graduate with a postgraduate diploma in Human Resources Management. In 2016, she was recognized as one of the 100 most influential Filipina and 100 most influential HR professionals. In 2018, she was awarded a Socially Responsible Entrepreneur of the Year by the Cebu Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Friends, let us all welcome Ms. Paulette Liu. Ma'am, you have the floor. Thank you, Sheila. Um, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. First of all, I'd like to thank the Philippine Institute for Development Studies for inviting us in this event. We are also grateful to Dr. Arbeta and Mr. John Paul Corpus for the relevant research, which sheds light on the country's use not in education, employment, or training. This research revealed data to guide the creation of appropriate policies and programs that would significantly impact our economy. Before I proceed, let me first introduce our organization, Primary Structures Educational Foundation Inc., or School of Knowledge for Industrial Labor and Service, Leadership and Service, or PSEFI Skills. We are the corporate foundation of the primary group of builders, or PGB. PGB is a 70-year-old Cebu-based organization specializing in integrated shelter solutions. We operate business in the fields of construction, real estate, manufacturing, shipping and logistics, health and lifestyle, and human capital development. PGB greatly values technical vocational education and training. Next slide, please. To ensure that our skills development programs are sustainable and strategically addresses poverty, PGB founded PSEFI Skills in 2008. We are committed to train and certify globally competent Filipino workers. PSEFI Skills envisions to be a leading institution in developing capability of globally competent Filipinos, enriching lives and contributing to social development. PSEFI Skills have two flagship programs, the Academic Senior High School, where a standalone senior high, and a technical vocational education and training. We focus on demand-driven courses, or those courses needed by industries such as construction, Heavy equipment, manufacturing, health services, maritime, and hospitality and tourism. Our services include provision of scholarships, training, assessment and certification, job matching, and community mobilization. To date, we have trained and assessed over 20,000 marginalized Filipinos 
unemployed men and women, out of school youth, and differently abled persons, particularly the deaf. Our operations are accredited by the government, and we also work with local international development agencies. I'd like to react now to the PIDS research. Uh, we respond to three crucial information revealed by the study, and these are the high demand for construction workers, but few takers. Second, for years of the youth to pursue in Tibet. And the third one is the quality of training. Construction contributes significantly to our GDP. This became more pronounced with the current administration's build, build, build program. And to accelerate construction projects, Dole reported that the country needs at least one million skilled workers. But where do we find them? The study revealed that construction ranked second from the lowest in terms of number of graduates among the top 10 in that sector. Most offered and most in demand courses are under tourism. But we all know the tourism has been very much affected by the pandemic, causing slowdown in operations, retrenchments, and even closure. Globally, construction workers remain the number one in demand, but most hard and difficult to find workers. Decades long perceptions about construction jobs have remained that construction is dirty, dangerous, difficult, and dead end. And construction is only for men, no space for women. But PSEFI skills continues to challenge these perceptions to elevate the dignity of skilled construction professionals. We demonstrate this through three key strategies multi skilling, industry certification, and integration of women in the construction industry. PSEFI skills advocates multi skilling, wherein workers are trained to possess different skills needed in various stages of construction. For instance, the construction of a toilet will require different competencies, roughly eight to 10, from carpentry, masonry, plumbing, tile setting, electrical, waterproofing, and etc. That's does national certifications for all these qualifications. So instead of having several workers to work in a small toilet space, we only have one person trained in all these competencies. A person with multi skill who possesses these qualifications becomes more valuable in construction is better paid, has job security, better chances of career mobility, and could engage in entrepreneurial activities. You know, he can be a skilled worker, construction worker during weekdays, and an entrepreneur or a subcontractor during weekend. This could also be a long-term solution to unemployment and skills shortage. PSEFI skills also advocates industry certification. At skills, we integrated construction skills in our senior high school curriculum. This means that our senior high graduates possess a diploma and at least three to four TESLA NC2s in construction, such as carpentry, masonry, plumbing, and tile setting. We then endorse these graduates to a program called ACAS, or Assessment Certification and Accreditation System. This is a multi-stakeholder strategy initiated by Cebu Chamber of Commerce to address the unemployment in the youth sector. With the ACAS, they earn their job titles builder assistant, not as carpenters, not as masons, not as tile setters, but as builder assistant. As builder assistants, they are reliable and have the industry-specific skills and competencies. They can perform various tasks, construction projects, and are also assured of better pay. With the ACAS, we elevate the dignity and pride of the skilled worker. At present, PSEFI Skills is preparing its diploma program in construction technology, which would lead to a degree in civil engineering. We are doing this to engage the youth to look at construction as a stepping stone to a better life, to a better future. We have also successfully integrated women in construction. We have trained multi skilled handy women, these are women who maintain our buildings and the PGB properties in Cebu. These women are multi skilled, skilled in carpentry, masonry, tile setting, plumbing, and electrical installation and maintenance. We also have heavy equipment operators who are women, women who operate bulldozer, payloaders, and cranes. To make this possible and sustainable, it is necessary to create an enabling environment for the women to flourish by instituting relevant policies, 
enforcing respect and recognition of their contributions. Another point I'd like to stress is that uh, the barriers to pursuing Tibet. The study revealed that financial constraint is the main barrier to Tibet. Youth needs also lack information and are oftentimes engaged in housework, especially the women, preventing them from seeking training and jobs. The study thus recommends various support to boost youth participation in Tibet, such as tuition and allowance support, better dissemination of information, and job search support. We also need to enlighten the youth about Tibet, change the mindset of parents to influence the minds of these youth, and innovate the kind of education we deliver to make Tibet more attractive. At the primary group of builders, we engage trainees to complete their work immersion with us. Aside from free tuition and assessment fees provided by TESTA, trainees receive allowances to lessen the financial burden on their families. We also engage with various local partners to contribute resources for food, transportation, and pre-employment requirements to implement the scholarships provided by TESTA. We encourage companies that they can demonstrate their corporate social responsibility or intend to do good for society by investing in Tibet trainees who, are, who will become their potential or future employees. The government can also introduce incentive to these companies, companies who will support this kind of program. Another emerging barrier to pursue Tibet is the suspension of face-to-face -face classes in compliance with IATF regulations. This is difficult for Tibet as face-to-face -face demonstration of competency is really necessary. PSEFI skills encourages technical vocational institutes to adapt blended learning approaches. PSEFI skills build a learning management system that can be accessed using mobile phones, computers, or tablets. This way, trainees can continue learning remotely with the aid of videos, games, and modules. We actually gamify the construction industry, the construction course. Definitely face-to-face -face interaction cannot be eliminated as hands-on technical competencies have to be demonstrated. However, the blended approach mitigates the health risks and is suitable for the current digital savvy generation. The study surface that training skills may be falling short in quality. Technical vocational institutes may lack the equipment and facilities that are up to par with industry standards. The curriculum may also be outdated and no longer relevant to the industry. Many trainers do not have any industry experience to ensure alignment to current industry practices and technologies. Trainees have minimal industry motion arms, not enough to acquire and demonstrate the basic competencies. All of this will result to having graduates that have the skills required in the workplace. Skills work closely with the industry. And our trainees spend 75% of their time immersed in the workplaces of our industry partners. This ensures that our graduates are job ready. Should TESTA continue to maximize its own training centers, then there is a need to ensure that recruitment are up to date and the trainers and successors are industry practitioners. Moreover, we also recommend mechanisms for industry practitioners to be immediately accredited as trainers and assessors. PSEFI skills endeavors to be up to speed with the skills requirements of the industry. Skills has recently been granted by TESDA a certification to run an NTR, or No Training Regulation Program, called MAS, or Medical Auxiliary Specialized Services. MAS is a six month medical course to address the shortage of health practitioners. MAS graduates assist doctors and nurses in managing the triage and providing basic life support, among other essential functions. This industry-driven approach to Tibet ensures that the right skills are available at the right time. I'd like to give some few key takeaways. Starting this January, Skills was honored to be part of the Regional Technical Education Skills Development Committee of Region 7, or the RTESDC. This RTSDC is convened by TESTA, is composed of representatives from government agencies and the private sector. Earlier this week, the committee had its first meeting and the plans and directions resonate with our forum this afternoon. Let me share some activities with the committee for this year. First, the committee plans to implement an area-based 
demand driven to death so that we can become we can better respond to the skills requirements of the local industries and enhance employability of these. These require skills mapping and identification of skills requirements at the provincial level. This approach should enable us to disseminate the right information and influence the youth team. TESTA IDLE is one of the TESTA's reward mechanism, which gives recognition to the vet graduates so that then attain skills excellence and became successful in the chosen endeavors and contributing to the economic growth in the communities. Now, this campaign should hopefully help attract our youth needs to the opportunities in Tibet and improve its image and perception. The members of RTSDC are also pushed to participate in various Tibet industry consultations. Now, to increase our awareness of the current Tibet sector situation and to generate critical inputs to policy making. The research of Dr. Abeta and Mr. Corpus and this webinar organized by PIDS is truly relevant and insightful. The information about the youth need in Philippines is relevant to our work in RTSDC to guide us in creating policies and programs that would impact the youth. We hope to have more conversations with, with PIDS and the researchers in these coming months. It would also be best to have a more formal and regular government industry academic dialogues and conversations. Just to close this, uh, I would like to thank you once again to PIDS for engaging PSEFI skills in the study. We would also like to congratulate Dr. Ogeta and Mr. Parpos for the relevant study. We hope that our experiences of PSEFI skills have further validated the crucial findings of the research. We also hope that our experiences have also inspired our fellow academic institutions and social development practitioners to recognize the contributions of Tibet and to elevate its status in the education and training continuum. Today, companies are no longer dependent on diploma to validate the skills and competencies of candidates. More than ever, skills are already so much value. There's never been a better time for Tibet to flourish. Thank you very much and good afternoon. And thank you very much. It's an honor to have you at our webinar. Um, uh, President uh, Paulette Liu of uh, PSEFI Skills, uh, we really appreciate your sharing with us the initiatives of your foundation to um, um, strengthen the delivery of uh, TVET uh, programs uh, and also your um, strategies to, to make the, the delivery of these programs more inclusive, you know, um, especially when it comes to, in, in terms of uh, women, making it more gender inclusive. Maraming salamat, ma. We will hear more from you during the open forum. Okay, Thank so you. friends, at this point, um, well, we have heard the presentations of our authors and the insights of our uh, discussions. Uh, and this time, we would like to hear from you, okay? But before that, um, let us have a poll, uh, and our participants in WebEx and those who are watching us on Facebook are welcome to join our poll. So is our question uh, ready? Okay. So here is our question. So just uh, for those who are watching us on Facebook, just uh, key in your question in the comment section, and those who are watching us on uh, WebEx, just uh, choose from um, uh, the... Um, the choices that you can see on the screen. The question is, according to the study, which is the topmost reason that hinders youth meet from pursuing tech book education and training? Is it A, no information, B, housework or caring duties, C, no funds for tuition or allowance, or D, working or seeking for work? Okay, so you may key in your answer now. Gwen, please let us know. Okay, so uh, you only have a... Uh, Four seconds to answer. I'm closing the poll now. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let us know if the uh, if the results are ready. So is it A, B, C, or D? Five more okay. seconds. Yes. Okay. Okay. So the answer is C. So let's uh, look at the uh, results. Okay, so only 
four or C, which is no funds for tuition or allowance, only 24 from our WebEx participants got it right. Okay, so what we will do is we will select uh, two names, okay, two uh, who will be our winners from among our WebEx participants, okay. So we will randomly pick two winners. And for those who join on Facebook, we will check the two Facebook viewers who answered the question correctly first. And I, I will announce uh, the winners, all the winners towards the end of the webinar, and each of them will get a, a PIDS notebook. Okay, so let us now proceed to the open forum. So at this point, I'd like to invite our presenters, uh, Dr. Arbeta, JP, and our uh, excellent panel of speakers, Edi Basiliote, Edi Constantino, and uh, Ms. Sapolet New. Okay, so let me begin with the first question. Um, okay. We have a question from uh, Dr. Um, Lianto, um, former president of PIDS and now currently uh, a member of our board of trustees. And this is about the um, low intake of construction jobs. Okay, let me read his comment. Um, it seems there is a need to improve the youth's attitude to training. The information on their attitude toward construction training reveals deeper problems like societies or families need to instill the importance of discipline and good attitude. However, in this particular case, the youth are saying something here that construction jobs are dead end, meaning they would rather be trained in skill that will help them progress in life. Okay, so what should the government do? Okay, uh, perhaps I can direct this question before I go to Miss uh, Miss Liu because she has told us a while ago of the uh, initiatives of PSTFI. We can go first to the inside of um, ED um, Constantino, ma'am. Yeah, Sheila. Um, right now we are uh, working with DTI for the development of the Philippine Skills Framework for the different sectors and construction is part of that. Um, maybe that's one way we can promote uh, the construction industry to the youth because they would know the career progression of the construction workers from the um, laborers going towards the um, higher uh, positions in the sector. Um, initially, the Philippine Skills Framework has uh, launched already for the logistics and supply chain and they're working on the IT BPM sector. So um, I think construction is already in the pipeline. So that's what that's uh, one of the initiatives of the government. Uh, it is anchored on the um, skills framework also of the uh, of Singapore. That's where we are benchmarking on. Uh, we're working with DTI, Dole, and um, uh, test days there, and then of course Ched and um, DepEd, PRC and other um, agencies, the sectoral agencies, depending on the sector. So these are our um, initiatives right now so that all our programs will be harmonized. And even our um, Kababayans would know the, the vertical and uh, horizontal progression of, the, of their careers based on this skills framework. Thank you very much, Edie Constantino. Let me um, read a, um, a related comment from Vicente Camilon. Uh, he said, there are many highly skilled construction workers, but they prefer to go abroad because of higher pay and benefits. If the construction industry can offer the same, maybe we won't have a shortage of skills related to construction in the country. So you were talking uh, a while ago of, uh, you know, uh, coming up with a really comprehensive uh, program with, which also addresses, you know, so there's gonna be skills progression. And with this skills progression also, of course, yung, yung pay na, na address yon na no. But what can you say about this comment from Mr. Vicente, ma'am? Yes, actually in one of our conversations with our industry partners in the um, construction sector, they're saying really that we cannot stop the migration of workers. So, uh, because um, we have to accept the fact that um, the, the other countries would pay, uh, would have a better pay for, for, for um, skilled workers. And uh, there are a lot of fa factors that we have to consider also on how we will be able to, um, to 
uh, be at par with the other countries. So what we are um, we are working on right now is to um, train more workers uh, for for these different sectors because that's our um, that's our strength. Yung, yung labor force natin. So we have to train more workers so that we'll be able to produce rightfully skilled workers uh, na yung, talagang in, yung competencies nila are, are aligned with the industry requirements so that even if there's a migration of workers, uh, we will have a steady supply of, of these skilled workers until such time that we uh, reach that point that we are at par with the paying payment or the, the 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 salaries that are offered in other countries. Thank you very much, Ibi Basulote. Um, let me also get the the feedback of uh, Miss Liu because you mentioned a while ago that you are also promoting the construction uh, Tibet program to uh, to women. No, but what has been the uptake of? Uh, I mean, among women in terms of construction uh, Tibet programs, what? May nag, may nag ano po ba? May nag -e enroll Yeah, actually, we had our first, uh, many years back, we had our first heavy women operators. And uh, two years ago, we competed the handy women. These are usually married women, okay? Uh -huh. And uh, they're the one providing for the family that are enrolled in this program. But it's really very difficult to find women because very often when they're already skilled, the husbands get jealous and ask them to stop. That's usually our challenge. You now, when they become skilled and they start earning much, their husbands get jealous and they end up, you know, asking their spouses to, to stop the training and stay home. That's the usual way. But can I add to the first question for the year? Sure, man, go the, ahead, Paul. Yeah. Oh, Paul. Uh, being an HR also, in addition to being the head of the foundation, also the HR of a primary group of builders, and our mother company is a construction company. So as HR, we have to be creative in our compensation packages for the rank and file. So what we did was to create, uh, we introduced the multi-scaling and the bonding of the courses of the skills. So what we did with rank and file is, of course, you cannot match the dollar rate and everything, but right. what we did is we encouraged them to have further training. So every time they earn additional skill, we adapt we add to their compensation. So instead of hiring five different people to do the task, we have one person who can do the five tasks. Even if you double the pay of this of this person, it's still cheaper than hiring five different people. You save on fringes, you save on training and recruitment costs. So they're happy because they're they're paid very high, okay, and they're multi-skilled. And it, it's beneficial for both the company and the employee. And uh, we noticed that this is very effective because uh, they, we have a very low attrition rate. In addition to that, uh, we have hired several Tibet graduates who are now managers, supervisors in the company, and they're managing the departments very well compared to other engineers because they have the technical experience. So these are some classic, uh, some you know stories that they can share, success stories that we can share to, to others. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ms. Liu. I see um, Edi Basiliote nodding, nodding her head. Would you like to uh, add to that, uh, Edie Love? Sheila, um, yeah, actually, just just a note on on salaries. No, um, I think it's not just a construction problem; it's just the overall salary compensation um, problem in the Philippines. Um, I think we we so there are jobs out, many jobs out there, but you know whether they are good jobs, meaning you know they they're able to to give decent compensation so that people are able to live decent lives that's another that's another question so i just want to say that the compensation issue is not just a construction problem but i think mm -hmm. an overall you know national problem of how we compensate people but but to be pro to have maybe a productive comment on on that issue i agree with um miss polet no that actually keeping keeping employees does not only include financial compensation um in our in our um experience as well and even in keeping trainees um it's also about the psychosocial support that we mm -hmm. provide them um the, the 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 psychosocial safety that we we provide them as well and so they're able to complete the training program um, and it's it's the small what we maybe considered small things, but yung mga tulong like for example, okay, if you get sick, 
Um, do you get or you get COVID? Do you get paid leave? Mm -hmm. Um, things like that, um, I think we can actually add on to like how we treat our, our workers so that, you know, mm -hmm. they, they stay. Um, but, but then again, you know, like it's, it's a global competition now for skills, right? Mm -hmm. So it is actually also a challenge, um, a challenge or to, to industry to, to retain these skills because they're not competing just locally they're also competing, competing globally so globally. um yeah i'll end my 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 note there on on compensation thank you thank you very much um Edie, Edie love no um actually vicente Camillion has a, a follow-up question and he said how can we address the shortage of skills by continuous training if highly skilled workers still prefer to work overseas it means that we will continue to have skills shortage well um our test executive director said we'll just to keep on you know training training more people attracting them to this uh, you know to construction jobs in other uh, in other areas you no know? and perhaps a doctor or beta can uh, can add to this you no know? would you have any feedback sir on the question of uh, mr Camillion? yeah i i, I think uh, that's a that's a human right. Uh, when uh, it's not uh, as huge, what we see are people moving, but they have always considerations and leaving family here mm -hmm. and working. So, uh, but so there's uh, I think it's not a, a, a small amount of decision to be preferring to work abroad rather than here. So, uh, and you can't prevent this. You can't prevent people from leaving uh that's that's, that's, that's their choice uh, their mm -hmm. calculation you have to respect their calculations so all that you can uh, really uh, do is is, is uh, the, the same uh, like for example we have we have this uh, perennial uh, perennial question about nurses leaving when we need nurses here so uh so uh, should we prevent them from leaving because we need them here uh, I, i've said that there there is always a very deep personal calculation about working abroad uh, so we should respect that if they do decide to work abroad then uh, we have to let them because that's 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 not a simple decision that right. it's not a, like a whim of decision that they said be so uh, it's also a challenge for us and, 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 and a challenge for the country to 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 improve our working conditions I've said love has already mentioned things that uh, working is not about like there are work that you need to be working abroad to have the environment to sharpen your 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 thinking your skills and all of that but uh, there are work that uh, uh, you can also do here like one of the one of the good things that's happening for the country is really uh, providing uh, is, is still is still working basically is is working abroad but staying here that's a good if we can improve that uh, that conditions of that even if they're working in in in, in foreign in foreign uh, offices but staying in the philippines uh that's an opportunity that we should be uh, yes. should be because uh then uh, you, you improve the chances of them staying here. Uh, right. for, for, for Tibet, uh, there, there will be, there will always be who would like to, to experience uh, complex work environments because that's what professionally they would need. Uh, as I've said, it's a very complex personal, we have to respect that. It's not a simple okay. sim this, this, this decision to work abroad. It's not a simple one. Uh, and if they do decide, then we should not be preventing them, but we can make our uh, uh, working conditions the, the best that it can be, as Slava said. Okay. It's not always about the money. I, I don't think it's not it's not only about the money. There are many things on the decisions to work about. Mm -hmm. Ask us, okay. from, from construction workers to, to, to very uh, cutting edge scientists, there are many uh, uh, considerations in working abroad. Thank you very much, Dr. Arbeta. So I, ha I have this, um, I have a question for, and any of you can answer this, because we have this prevailing notion that tech book education is inferior to a college degree, no? And uh, 
but but how can we address this and uh, clearly um college education is 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 not for everyone um and and um so what what should the government and the private sector do besides more intensive promotion of that tech book i i think it, it it's important that people see the results meaning they see tech book graduates getting employed and landing in good jobs and this brings me to the second part of my question which is uh, what is the employment rate of our tech book graduates okay. uh anyone can answer that yes sir yes sir go ahead <laughs> Okay, uh, one of the nice things I've seen in data now is that college graduates are and undergraduates are the bulk of the ones taking the last uh, the 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 last uh, what's called this the last treasure uh, the study of TESDA, uh, which which uh, surveys graduates of the last year. I have seen the the proportion that the the biggest group now taking uh, tech book are college undergraduates as well as college graduates. That's, that means that uh, our college graduates requires the skills uh, that can be offered by test by TESDA, not just the degrees. So that there is a shift. It used to be that they're the biggest, uh, the intention actually is for high school graduates uh, for, but no longer the case in the last uh, survey that I have, I have looked at. It's, it's, it's now college graduates. So uh, there is this, uh, I think it, it depends upon the, 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 the before the, think, the people thinking that Tibet has a, is, is, is lower in terms of, because of the, I think of, of the salary, salary uh, uh, difference. But uh, uh, now that uh, people are acknowledging that they need skills, not just your theory, to be employable, they're going. To, many of them are going, even if they have already the college degrees. So it's not. It's no longer the case that Tibet is an an, an end goal, but it's actually augmenting what they already have to make them employable. So that's that's the this, that's, that's this shift that we are seeing in the data, and uh, I, I'll be observing that and if that continues on in, in the next years. So that means that. Uh, uh the, the the newer jobs doesn't uh is not satisfied with college degrees mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you need to have skills to be employable and 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 you need the skills to be employable that's why people are our are, are students are taking tvet as well so that that's the the uh, pro, uh the the hope that i that i'm seeing on the data okay. uh, and uh and I think uh, we should, uh, one of the things that was mentioned is about uh, Tibet idols, right? For example, I'd like to mention mm. the, the Puging lineman. In <laughs> Tibet idols, yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe we should use that uh, 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 Guapang line woman maybe next time. So you <laughs> using, uh, and, and like uh, Senator Pacquiao being the, the uh, of ALS. So those kinds of, uh, we should be using, I uh, should be promoting just like we promote, uh, of course, they self promote our our uh, performing arts artists. We should be promoting uh, T Tibet graduates who have made it well. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. like, uh, so mm -hmm. that, 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 that 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 that's also that uh, you can have a good life with a Tibet uh, degree. Mm -hmm. So that's basically the, conveying that message is very important. That's right. Thank you very much, Doctor Orbeta. Ed Constant. Okay um love okay oh sorry very just very quickly because i when i saw the report i had kind of like a data staring session <laughs> basically i just looked at one slide and you know like um and 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 checked what the what the data said and um actually it was connected to your poll right what's preventing the youth from accessing yes. um even um and they say that it's financial and so actually i feel very very strongly about um, supporting the the youth who are involved in TVET um, when it comes to the wrap around cost to training. So TESDA has TESDA scholarships, right? And they have a lot of scholarships, but it's really just about the tuition. But then mm -hmm. if you, and, and Ms. Paulette can speak to this, um, if you go into construction, it's not enough. It's like you have the, the, the uniforms, the has, hazard, like hazmat, 
the and then the transportation especially now with covid um they can't really travel from you know from their homes to the construction site um so all of these costs we are not accounting for and therefore they're saying okay libre nga yung tuition but i can't get naman to the training facility so you know i'm not gonna go so mm -hmm. i think you know we need to we need to really rethink the way we also design our cost our like our support package for the youth who are accessing these training programs because it's it's not just about i mean they they make rational decisions eh? Like to what um, Dr. Orbeta is saying, it, there's a lot of consideration when they choose to, to go to training, to go to employment. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, it's, and it's not enough to just say, oh, okay, these are the parang sweldo or the salaries. It's really, okay, how do we get you from point A to point B? Um, and we need to make that, that bridge strong and, you know, like really supportive and safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edie Love. Um... Idi uh, Constantino, can I call you now? So two things, ma'am. Uh, first is how what can we do to attract uh, more uh, more youth, but especially youth need uh, to go into um, uh, Tibet. And and then secondly, you may want to uh, expound on uh, the support programs that you have uh, earlier uh, mentioned in your presentation. The allowances, no, um, that you have you have started to uh, to uh, provide to. Uh, Tibet learners. Go ahead, ma'am. Thank you. Um, first of all, I agree with what Dr. Orbeta said that uh, it is in the packaging. It's in the it's in advocating, in promoting Tibet. Mm -hmm. um, that is um, uh, the 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 notion of, of being a second class citizen if you're a Tibet graduate. But now we are seeing that Tibet is uh, really important, uh, an important um, contributor in economic development. Um, Tibet is also seen as an effective tool for lifelong learning. So with these um, new developments in the Tibet environment, we are, uh, we have developed um, other policies such as micro-credentialing and uh, to ensure that uh, the current workers will be able to upskill or reskill themselves even in short-term um, courses or uh, micro or nano programs so that they would not have to go through the, a lengthy training program for them to be uh, able to acquire competencies that are needed in the workplace. We are also, um, uh, what Secretary La Peña has just said in the last General Directorate Conference, we have to strengthen uh, the implementation of higher level PQF uh, programs uh, so that we'll be able to develop or produce more qualified technicians and technologists. So that's uh, that answers also what um, Ms. Paulette said that uh, we have to uh, make sure that they are um, uh, pos that they possess um, the skills, the different skills. They they are multi-skilled, so that um, the companies will also benefit from from the 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 savings that they will have by by. Um, by just hiring a highly skilled technician or technologist rather than hiring five different operators to just perform a simple task. So these are the things that we are working on. Uh, I, I hope that uh, we will be able to, to accomplish this through the help of our stakeholders. Uh, as what I've said earlier, we have um, we are implementing the area-based and demand-driven event where in the industry boards would play a very important role in every step of the implementation. So from, from identification of the skills needs to the standards development, curriculum development, trainers and assessors development, up until the implementation of the scholarship program. As to the scholarship program, um, we have rationalized actually the, the schedule of cost because there were just a few of the scholarship programs before which, which had um, allowances for, for the beneficiaries. However, based on the, uh, the feedback that we get also from the field, that the scholars would really need to have their uh, training support fund or the daily allowances to help them not only in transportation, but as well as in the, uh, the, the meals that, that they need every day. And also um, the, the uh, health and uh, safety 
protocols that they have to observe. So that's why we have the health and PPE allowance as well as the uh, internet allowance to help them if, in case um, they are um, having the online classes or, or the combination learning modality that, that, that they would um, avail of. So these are the things that we're working on. Uh, it is not yet perfect, but uh, of course, with with the help of the input of our stakeholders and the researches such as this, we'll be able to improve on all our policies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edie Constantino. Ms. Paulette, ma'am, um, your turn. Yeah, I'd like to add to that. Uh, I agree with everyone that we need to strengthen the campaign, regarding the TVET campaign, to, to entice the youth and to make also our partner companies understand. Um, I think one very important thing is all the big players like Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, everything, all of those companies no longer value diploma, but the skills. Unfortunately, in the Philippines, most of the companies still look for diploma, for graduates with diploma. So I think it's also important for us not only to educate the youth about Tibet, but also the, the different companies on the value of a skilled worker of having a diploma. That's the diploma. Thank you very much. Uh this uh, PS, uh, PSEFI provides scholarships and let's say support allowances, but uh, especially for for uh, programs that are uh, you know a bit expensive to take. <laughs> yes, actually, well, are all the scholars that took more than twenty thousand scholars of graduates of skills are all scholars. They didn't pay a single cent. <gasps> Okay. So yeah, it's all uh, fully subsidized by the foundation. So we have different partners, the primary group, which is composed of 15 corporations, funnel, provide uh, support, funding support to the foundation. So we have scholars every year. So we, they provide the uh, free accommodations and allowances, mm -hmm. transportation mm -hmm. and meals for all our scholars. We also, when we have industry partners for the job immersion of our students, oh, yeah. we also make it part of the contract that this industry partnership provide allowances for our scholars as well. Yes. Uh, you own a construction company, so does it mean that uh, the, cons the the graduates the graduates of your TVET construction programs can easily be hired by your yes by your firm? Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, automatic. That's why we say it's demand driven because we don't offer the same courses every year. So we ask our industry partners, we say the industry partners, that's the different companies of the primary group, at the same time, the different associations or organizations that skills is part of, like uh, the Cebu Chamber of Commerce, the Cebu Contractors Association, the HRAP. So we ask them, what are your current requirements for the year? Then we run programs so that our graduates, our, our graduates are assured of employment after the training. Because it's used that we our, our main thrust is poverty alleviation. So what's the point of training if they can find jobs after the training? So it defeats our purpose, our, 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 our advocacy. So we always focus on what is needed. Like right now we're short, we have a shortage of nurses, but we can't just wait and you know things to happen. So what we do, what can we do to help the medical industry? So we created a program, the mass program, which is a no training regulation and created the Medical Auxiliary Specialized Services Program to address the shortage. Thank you very much. It's a very good case. Thank you very much for yeah. sharing with us. Okay, uh, let's entertain some questions from um, our Facebook viewers. And we have one from uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Executive Director Merwin Zalazar of uh, the Senate Economic Planning Office. And perhaps uh, uh, she can answer this. Do you have figure for neat active or young people who are neither employed nor in education or training, but are not actively seeking work? Um, okay. Dr. Beto or JP, uh, did you uh, did you find some data on, on this in your research? Yeah. I do, JP. JP would know, but but uh, yeah, there is. Uh, is he asking about need that are need that are, that are not uh, actively seeking work? Okay, so if you are if you are need, then you are not uh, actively seeking work. Then you you're are not, not in the labor, force. labor force. You're mm -hmm. not in the labor force. So you need essentially. So mm -hmm. that 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 definition is part of need. Of uh, need. Uh, yeah, so you're already part of NEET when you are not actively seeking work and you are eligible for, uh, you are, by age, you are eligible for work. Yes. 
Okay, thank you very much for the clarification, Dr. Orbeta. Um, okay, we have a question here of, from Ms. Mildred Purificacion, one of our web, WebEx participants. Could elementary and high school undergraduates enroll in the Tibet? Since most of the youth do not want to enroll in construction courses, can you consider undergrads who are currently engaged in construction work to be part of this program? Um, Anyone can answer that? Uh, EB, perhaps, yes. Um, yes? Uh, well, EB for, for the, yes, for, for the um, uh, Tibet programs, we have uh, different entry level requirements depending on the training program. Um, <clears throat> there would be those that would uh, require a 10 year basic education uh, a 10-year basic education completer or a senior high school graduate, it would depend actually. But there are also qualifications or training programs that would accept um, uh, undergrad or even those who have no grade completed yet because um, we have this, as I said earlier, the guiding principle of TESA, TESA Abot Lahat. So we have identified um, other training programs that would suit the needs of all of our um, constituents or our kababayan. So they can just um, log into the TESDA app or tesda.gov.ph, visit that our website, and they can access the link on how to um, inquire about our training programs or scholarship programs that they would be interested in. Thank you very much, Edie Constantino. We have a question here, uh, and it's it's directed to TESTA. Do TESTA scholarships uh, support diploma courses? I, I, I you do. Yes, uh, uh, yes. We have the Universal Access to Quality Tertiary Education Scholarship Program. Uh, this is for uh, intended for the diploma uh, courses. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, for your response, uh, Edie uh, Constantino. Um, since you're already there, um, can, can you give us, um, can you um, uh, enlighten us about TESDA's initiatives to improve the curriculum of Tibet programs and the quality of trainers, since this is one of the uh, findings of the studies? Yes, uh, as I've mentioned earlier, we are implementing the, the area-based and demand-driven Tibet uh, program. Uh, this is in response to the ADB Tibet sector study um, on how we would be able to address job skills mismatch, as well as the organizational development sessions that we did with Professor Morato. And they said that we really have to be more industry focused and area specific. So what we're doing now is uh, what, what uh, Mampolet said earlier that the RTSDC was in, involved in the skills mapping of the area so that they would be able to identify the specific skills requirements in a particular province or region. And from that, uh, it would be endorsed by the, the respective technical education skills development committees. It will be the basis in coming up with competency standards and curriculum, uh, competency-based curriculum, as well as the development of the trainers and assessors in that particular area. This is in close collaboration with the recognized industry boards so that uh, in every process, in every step of the way, the, the inputs or the, the competencies required of that particular um, sector will be considered and, and uh, would be an important input in the development of the standards and the curriculum. So this is what we're doing right now. And then at the national level, we're also doing that. Uh, we have national uh, nationally recognized industry boards that are, that are helping us review our training regulations and develop more training regulations and competency standards that are in demand. So we are prioritizing all of these programs so uh, that we would be able to address or be able to provide um, relevant training programs uh, that are needed in our new environment. Thank you very much, um, Ibia Constantino. We have other in, um, 
a few more questions here. Um, this, these questions are from Marielle Lourdes Mendoza of the House of Representatives. He's just asking if we have, uh, if you have disaggregated data about Four Peace Youth. Um, this program, I think she's referring to the Four Peace, is supposed to encourage the young beneficiaries to be in school, yes. Uh, and is the teenage pregnancy related to being youth meet? Uh, Dr. Orbeta, you may want to answer this. Um, we don't, perhaps, we for, perhaps for a piece, uh, meet youth. We, we didn't have, uh, uh, we didn't do the disaggregation for four piece, uh, 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 need, uh, uh, or disaggregated need data by four mm. piece. But maybe we can do that with, uh, the APIS data, but we didn't do that. But, uh, I think it's, it's doable. What, what what we have uh, is our what I can remember because I'm involved in it is the is the evaluation of the four piece program which include non four piece so basically mm -hmm. the, the there was no uh, discernible difference in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, activity uh, labor force activity between uh, four piece and non four piece that's one. Uh, the other thing that we found is that the four piece usually leave schools later than the non four piece. So because of because they are, they are so the program is basically in, uh, retaining the children uh, in school uh, compared to there. So that's that's what I remember because I I uh, as as you know we we have done the uh, we're doing the evaluation of four piece the four piece programs and we compare four piece and non four piece. But in terms of need data uh, disaggregated into uh, four piece and not four piece. You have not done that, although I, 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 I think it's doable using APIS uh, data set, but we have not done it for the study. Maybe that, that, that's perhaps one thing that you should be doing. Uh, but that, that, that's, that's the information that I have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How about the second question, sir? Is teenage pregnancy related to being need? Well, we can only discern. <laughs> We don't have any, uh, you know. Uh, we don't. We, well, we didn't do that as well. Uh, yes. You're preparing, uh, yeah. Uh, the idea is we don't say anything unless we have data to support it. Yes, definitely. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Orbeta. Okay. Let's entertain another question from our chat box. And this one is from Christian Gomez. Do we have the options for ladderized courses linking pivot to college for those who would like to pursue college down the line but are opting to do pivot work for now? Also, are, are many companies now open to ap apprenticeships, internships useful for pivot? Um, Edie Constantino, would you like to answer this, ma'am? Yes. Uh, well, for the, the ladderized program, uh, we have been implementing that um, since the time of uh, former Director General Si Hu. Uh, but the, the, that particular program was turned over to CHED already. Now, what we are doing is the uh, Philippine Credit Transfer System. It's um, uh, crediting the, the competencies that are acquired from the TVET programs that they, uh, that they graduated from. Uh, when they apply for a higher uh, for for a bachelor's degree, but this is still in the works because um, there are still policies that we have to harmonize with that of chance. And so, what we are um, working on is first the the credit transfer of the different uh, the, the the different competencies from one from one school to another. So that's the the Tibet portion of the Philippine credit transfer system. Um, another is uh, there are there are Tibet schools that are also uh, hi higher education institutions. So they offer diploma programs, and so they have aligned their diploma programs to that of a bachelor's degree. So there's a smoother pathway from Tibet to to higher ed. But these are selected um, institutions. Those HEIs offering Tibet. Uh, diploma programs, they can easily do that. But for, for a TVET program or a TVI offering a 
event program uh, and then um, having it credited to a higher uh, level or a level six in the PQF, it's still in the works with SHED. Thank you very much, uh, Edie Constantino. Okay, allow me to read uh, uh, one of the comments. Uh, yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, the program in CHED is called ETIAP, uh, Expanded Tertiary Education Equivalency Accreditation. So that's that's the step for which uh, Tibet graduates can, can can go to, uh, can be certified as college. As college. Yeah. She, Sheila, may I just make a comment also yes. just to push um, ahead, one of love. actually TESDA's programs yes, yes. Um, on this. Yes. Um, really supporting the whole PQF um, implementation. So that's the Philippine Qualifications Framework. So framework. actually that will really facilitate the movement, mm -hmm. no? like the multiple pathways. So you can basically, you know, go to like a TVET program, um, get a certification or, you know, and then work. Um, and then your 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 prior learning is then recognized and then that go that can go towards, you know, a college degree. So um, this PQF system will, can, really has the potential to, you know, allow mobility um, in and out of training and employment for, for lifelong learning. Um, and then the second part of the question of Mr. Gomez on um, many companies now open to apprenticeships, internships useful for TVET, just um, based on our experience in in youth works, I mean, actually, uh, Miss Paulette's company is part of our member, uh, like our partner companies in, in the program. Um, we are really seeing a lot of companies, you know, um, uh, being open. So we have so so much more in terms of ratio. The number of training positions open is like is so much more than the number of applicants. Mm -hmm. So um, so yes, many. So the short answer to that question, yes, many companies are now open to apprenticeships and internships useful for TVET. Thank you. Thank you. And Miss Paulette, would you have anything to add to that? Um, like in the second question about uh, companies now being more open to apprenticeships or internships useful for that? Yeah, actually more companies are open to that because that becomes their uh, talent pipeline. <laughs> and you will notice that those who became their apprentice or intern after the training, they eventually get hired with the company. Because during the internship, they're able to observe that it comes the recruitment process with the company. You're able to observe the attitude, uh, you know, how they work and so on. So by the end of the training program, it's easier for them to spot the talent and be able to choose which one rather than, you know, just hire somebody, re recruit somebody without any prior experience and without even prior observation. And then you end up having a wrong hire, a mismatch. But with a, somebody who's been through training in your company, have been apprenticed at training your company, it would be a cost savings on your part and uh, cost-effective, yeah. Thank you very much, Ms. Liu. Okay, so let me just read one of uh, the comments of Mr. Manuel Aquino of uh, the Senate Economic Planning Office, uh, Executive Director Manuel Aquino. TESTA must engage, must enhance linkages with LGUs, which also offer training programs and are a rich source of information on Tibet for their constituents. More importantly, is to segue the training into entrepreneurship skills, or livelihood opportunities. Uh, the tracer studies that TESDA and the TESDA Women's Center have undertaken over the years are a rich source of lessons on how best to meet the challenges faced by trainees and how best to improve the TVET programs and how best the need could be included in TVET. Okay. Um, at this point, okay, to close the, to cap our discussion, may I ask each each speaker for their brief final remarks, starting from uh, Dr. Orbeta. Uh, I, I think yeah, the key the, that we would like to leave is really the, the importance of uh, Tibet's very much dependent on close coordination between, between uh, in, uh, industry and, 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 and TVIs uh, with government uh, encouraging that conversation always. I think so the industry boards is very much, we're looking forward that the industry boards will really flourish as the venue for that uh, and then and from the national to the local level because that's that's what Tibet uh, to be uh, closely uh, uh, in sync with it. With it, with it. And I'll, again, as I've mentioned that 
we need to know uh, uh, really what will make uh, uh, a need decide to be trained. Uh, we, uh, uh, we, need, uh, we know already that they need money, but that's not perhaps uh, money is not, uh, what kind of money do they need? Uh, uh, I think the term that loves use is wrap around kind of services. So basically knowing what they really require, uh, it has to be really no one's uh, just give them money to, to training money and all of that. But th there might be, uh, like for example, we already mentioned in times of COVID and uh, they can do a uh, theoretical part using uh, online, but they don't have devices. That's why PBED uh, has lent them tablets in order to be able to do that as well as those. So those kinds of things we, have, we need to know in order for that training to happen. And finally, I think uh, in answer to Mr. Aquino, uh, uh, LGUs have to be, one of the things that we will be, we should be avoiding is really training for training's sake. We should mm. not be counting how many we train, but how many of those who we have trained are able to find jobs or have their inter, uh, sustainable impl, uh, entrepreneurship or, or livelihood program. Those, those are the things that we got because that's the objective of the training, that's not the training itself. So basically that's, that's, uh, that should be the, the, the things that we should be counting. I, th I think I, I, I leave it. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Orbeta. And now uh, let's hear um, uh, the final remarks of uh, our uh, Executive Director for Planning of TESCA. E.D. Constantino, ma'am, please. Thank you, Sheila. So um, just uh, um, a rejoinder to what Dr. Herbeta said, I would just like to um, emphasize what Secretary La Peña has been saying, that um, our goal in TESDA is to provide training so that our graduates would have a, a, a job or a livelihood after. And that's really our intent. That's why we're, we're strengthening our partnership with our uh, industry boards with other stakeholders and we really welcome um, these kinds of um, studies so that we'll be able to improve on all of our policies and programs. Um, in the implementation of the area-based and demand-driven event, that's what we are uh, looking forward to. That's our, our aim that we would be able to um, be more relevant in all levels of our operations and be more responsive to the needs of our industry partners. Um, on the implementation of devolution, uh, given that uh, we have the Mandanas Garcia ruling and the EO138, we'll be working closely with our LGUs so that we'll be able to expand and strengthen the Tibet ecosystem in each locality. So uh, we, we are rest assured that TESDA is um, here to serve and to be able to reach out, especially those who are in the far-flung areas, those who are underreached. So, um, yeah, that's that's just um, my take on this, and thank you for inviting Testa here. And thank you very much, sir. Um, now, okay, let's go to uh, um, E.D. Uh, Love Bas Basiliote. E.D. Love? Yes, um, I just want to end um, my, my remarks today or participation in today's um, meeting no? um, by sharing PBED's moonshot or just cause. What we are working towards is by 2030, um, together with our partners in government, the private sector and civil society, we hope to have youth unemployment and even you know, make it less than 10% youth need rate by 2030. Um, and we, we want to do this by really being informed by data. And so we are very, that's why we're very excited about today's research. Um, so that the data that we have now will inform our programs, the policies that we will um, come out with, and also to encourage us to, in, to build more partnerships. And so I hope and I invite everyone here today to join us in this moonshot in the just cause of really ensuring that our youth are empowered and that they are employed. Thank you. Thank you very much, E.D. Love. And of course, last but not, definitely not the least, uh, we will hear from uh, Ms. Uh, Paulette Liu. Ma'am? Yeah, uh, I think uh, it's important for us to rally behind, you know, the Tibet, the scholars, the technical education scholars. And that will mean strengthen the campaign so that the youth will be advised to enroll in Tibet and that the companies also will understand the value of having and supporting the Tibet programs. 
Secondly, we need, I think, to strengthen the collaboration between government, industry, and academia. There has to be frequent conversations so that um, there's an alignment to the needs and they become more responsive, progress become more responsive to the industry. And this will also ensure higher employability on the scholars as well. Again, there's no skills are now more valued compared to the previous year. So I think we have to support the new people and provide them the necessary skills. Thank you very much, Ma'am Palette. Friends, uh, please join me in thanking our uh, paper authors and presenters, Dr. Orbeta and Mr. J.P. Corpus, and of course, our excellent panel of reactors, Executive Director Rosalina Constantino of Kesda, Executive Director La Basiliot of Tibet, and President and Chief Operating Officer Paul Diliu of the PSEFI schools for the insights that they have shared with us this afternoon. Maraming salamat po. Let us give all of them a big virtual clap. Okay. Uh, before we finally close, I would like to announce the winners of our poll. Let me check. Okay. From Webex, we have Gladys Ramos and Mike Musni. Mike Ramos. Uh, Gladys Ramos and Mike Musni. And from Facebook, only one uh, got the correct answer, and uh, she is Daffodil Sevilla Tampus, okay? I repeat, Gladys Ramos, uh, Mike Musni, and Daffodil Sevilla Tampus, uh, you won in our poll for uh, our webinar this week. So our webinar team will get in touch with you for your prize, okay? And finally, we have some reminders. Okay, so you can access all the, uh, the presentations from today's webinar from the PIDS website. And oh, please uh, also take the time to read the, um, the full studies, the, the complete studies of uh, Dr. Orbeta, JP, and Nina. Uh, so you'll uh, um, learn about, you know, um, get the details of the presentations from those from the full uh, studies. Please also answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after this webinar. We will email you the link after the event. Uh, your comments are very important to us so we can serve you better. And also please uh, regularly visit our website and social media pages. And thanks to all our uh, followers on Facebook and those who um, tune in to our um, a Twitter account for the live tweets of this virtual event. And join us in our next uh, webinars for this month. Okay, we have on February 7, we'll be talking about the SOCPEN or the Social Pension Program of the DSWD uh, PIDS conducted an evaluation of the SOCPEN program. So uh, please uh, um, attend or participate in our webinar uh, next week uh, so you can learn more about uh, that program and how effective it is especially amid the COVID-19 pandemic. And on February 24, we have our webinar on the FinTech landscape in the Philippines. We'll talk about the challenges and opportunities that our PIDS researchers found in their study about um, the FinTech landscape in the Philippines. And, um, and finally, we would like to acknowledge the various organizations from the government, academe, civil society, business, and international development community who joined us today. The names of these institutions are on our flash on the screen. Okay, so friends, this concludes our webinar for this week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed too. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. See you next week.